Got it. I want to welcome you all to our January gathering. It's our 90th year anniversary, and we have some great things planned for you, especially uh, the program that is put together by our wonderful VP of programming, Linda Rush Myers. And I want to introduce you to, to our two, uh, two new board members that we have. I just want to tell you who they are, which is Kashia Williams, which is the VP of communication. Since Linda Rush Myers is now VP of programming, we also have Gabriel Brett Freeman, who is uh, a board member at large. Um, I also wanted to make an announcement about Sue uh, Farlow, who's a former N NCPS um, uh, president. Uh, her memorial service has been postponed due to the snow until the summer. So we'll post about that when we get more information about that. And also I've posted a thing in the chat about the, uh, the poetry, uh, um, the poet of month that Weymouth House is running for uh, poetry month and that information is in the chat. So you might wanna check that out. I'm Celestine Davis. I'm the pres current president of uh, North Carolina Poetry Society, and I'm so excited to be here with you today. And I'm just so wonderful. I'm just so wonderfully happy about the program that we're going to see and the poets that we're going to get to listen to and ask questions. And so, right now, I'm going to turn over the programming. And the next voice you hear, once you are here, is our VP of Programmer, Linda Brush Myers. Linda. Yeah, so so look, we all know the protocols of these the Zoom. Um, uh, things. So go ahead and uh, other, if you, you're not speaking, go ahead and mute your microphone and tell your dogs to take a nap. And um, just those, those courtesies. And, uh, you know, if, if you do unmute, and I am known to do that. Um, and we learned the other day that if you have two computers on at the same time, everyone gets an echo. So uh, David, and uh, so we can have gatekeepers or several gatekeepers today who will help us be able to preserve our, our audio as our poets read. Um, listen, I'm going to put a couple notes in the chat. Um, and listen, if you don't have enough to do, I can help you out and, uh, and give you um, uh, an opportunity to share in the 90th anniversary celebration. So, if so is there any other announcement before we begin? Any other? Good, good. Well, just welcome everybody and thank you, Ms. Celestine. And we can go ahead and if we're ready to begin with our tribute to David Manning, and Celestine, Bill Griffin, and Shannon Ward will give you, will share with you more about this remarkable man. Thanks, Linda. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, thanks. Well, um, we thank you for the opportunity to uh, pay tribute to David Manning, who was a long time member of the North Carolina Poetry Society and passed away in December and left really kind of a unique imprint on our society. Uh, besides being a, a very talented and widely published poet himself, he, he supported poets and poetry all through the state. I, I think many of you know him as the founder and leader of the uh, Friday Noon Poets in Chapel Hill. And he also just brought a kind of unique strength to the North Carolina Poetry Society, often uh, kind of behind the scenes, but really essential. He was our bylaws guru, for one thing, from several major revisions. And uh, he helped devise five-year plans several times over the last 20 years. And he appeared at just about every Weymouth meeting when we were meeting in person to support people and give them encouragement and everything. So we're going to read a few poems by uh, David. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Shannon Ward and Celestine Davis, who are each going to read a poem and have a remark, and then I'll close with a final poem. So let me, let me introduce these two, and then I'll turn it over to them. Celestine, you know, uh, maybe you recognized her dynamic two years as VP of programming before she took over as president of NCPS just in time for our 90th anniversary. Uh, maybe you don't know that she has served as the regional representative for the NC Writers Network for Nash, Wilson, and Pitt counties since 2009, and she's on the editorial 
board of the uh, uh, NC Literary Review, which is the annual publication of, of ECU and the North Carolina Literary and Historical Association. And Shannon Ward, you're going to hear a lot more about in a few minutes during today's uh, workshop and presentation. She's a widely published poet with a lot of awards and fellowships and has an MFA from NC State. And she is the executive editor of Longleaf Press, which published by David Nunes at chat books. So Shannon is gonna begin with her remarks and then Celestine and then I'll close it up. Go, go ahead, Shannon. Thank you, Bill and Celestine and Linda and everybody for being here. Um, it's a real honor to uh, be here to help celebrate David Manning's life and work. Uh, I was first introduced to his work in around 2004 when I was an undergraduate student at Methodist University um, where Longleaf Press used to be housed. So Longleaf Press's founders, M Michael Colonese and Robin Green, um, first introduced me to David Manning's work uh, when he won Longleaf Press's chapbook contest in 2004 for his collection, The Ice Carver. Um, and I was absolutely captivated by this book. Um, and I know that David Manning was such an integral part of the North Carolina poetry community. And so it's just such an honor to be here and, and to help celebrate his life. Um, so I went back and forth a bit about what poem to read today. Uh, and as I was just rereading this collection in preparation. There are so many beautiful, beautiful poems in the collection. But then, you know, the snowstorm rolled in last night. I'm down in Fayetteville, and I have not seen this much snow in Fayetteville in, I think, over a decade. And I thought, you know what? This is just, I just need to read the art ice carver, <laughs> obviously, because um, the weather is telling me to do that. And I've, I've always loved the title poem of this collection. Um, it's part, Ars Poetica, so it's part a poem about writing, and it's also part an ekphrastic poem, so it's partially a poem about a piece of artwork, uh, which is the ice sculpture that Manning describes being created uh, in the content of the poem. Uh, and in addition to all that, it's just about kind of embracing the ephemerality of moments and uh, the conflicting impulses that poets and artists have to, to let those go, to let those transformative moments go, or also to try to nail them down. Um, and he kind of does both in this poem. So I've always thought that was beautiful. Um, the Ice Carver. On the promenade deck of the MS Tropica, the Ice Carver works against the clock. Intent is Donatello, he chips into the block, releases a falcon flying from the soft blue stone. He moves swiftly over the ice. The gathered crowd already losing focus, melting away to the next entertainment. His work complete, the carver steps back, brushing ice chips from his beard. In the cloud light, he could be a young Bonarotti, chiseled fragments in his dark hair recalling David's liberation from his white stone. Already the falcon's wings are wet and already the bell for lunch calls the stragglers away. A movement in the melting mirror catches the carver's eye, a white seabird vanishing. The carver's message passes like a poem never written down. So um, that's just one of the many beautiful, beautiful poems in this collection. And I did um, go ahead on the longleafpress.org website. This book is available. And if you use the code NCPS, like North Carolina Poetry Society, um, there's a 50% discount on it today. Um, so if you'd like to check out more of the poems, I encourage you to pick up a copy. It's a, a beautiful book. And uh, there's so many wonderful works in here. And I know that about Bill and that Celestine, you'll be sharing more. So thank you so much. So I hope I'm in muted now. Um, Celestine again, and, and I come from a different perspective, you know, cause I, I didn't, a lot of you may have actually met David Manning, I didn't. And when I became more involved with the poetry, um, uh, society, I realized what a big deal he really was. And after I read his work, I understood even more why he was a big deal. 
And so since I've been a part of the portrait, um, North, uh, North Carolina Portrait Society, I've really kind of sought out his work and to read them because I want to know why this man has such great influence. And so we know there's more than one way to become a poet. You know, there's not one way to be a poet, but if the objective is to, um, to connect with your audience, to help them come back for more, if that's, the, if, that's the, if that's the game of poetry, then David Manning was a master at that game. His work seemed to range from abstract, abstract to real to the surreal, and all the way he still had an authentic voice that kept you uh, mesmerized, it kept you grounded, and it kept you uh, just there in the moment and moved through the, those works with him. Um, Sometimes I have to, I have to say, because mm, some of his emotions that he shared really kind of hit home with me, you know, it kind of like stirred emotions I wasn't quite yet ready to deal with, you know, things like, you know, loss and fear and vulnerability. And, you know, he had a lot of humor in his poems, too. So uh, looking at the work set, I knew that um, that Shannon and Bill was going to read today. Uh, Bob, you know, Bill talked to me. He said, uh, why don't you do something that's, you know, funny? And so I looked through his his works and so I said, okay, that sounds, I like to read funny poems. So that was really uh, appealed to me. So I, I looked through some of the things he was written, he has written. And one of the things I looked at was called the box step, which is, you know, you think what it is, the box step, right? It's just about a guy doing a, um, basically a box step in an elevator. And I thought, oh, this has got to be funny, right? But then at the end, it was, oh, spicy ending. Maybe not, maybe I shouldn't read that one. And then I looked at one called Too Old for Vicky, which I thought, oh, that's probably going to be funny. Not funny at all, but definitely worth the read. It is such a phenomenal piece. It's like short and to the point, but it is something that, is, that really gripped me a lot. So look out for those two poems and read them. I think you enjoy them. So then I looked at Carburetor Man. With that, I thought about, hmm, I saw a thing about Stephen King and the Lawnmower Man, but no, it's not like that. It's really a great story about, I guess, two guys on a road trip and they their car broke down. And but it's more than that. It it really paints a picture uh, of of some works and it, it, that if you know um, mechanics, and I have a brother who is a mechanic and another brother who's mechanically inclined, and so I re it really resonated with me. It was so he had such a unique way of making the um, the simple things uh, be, you know, so unique and so outstanding. And so I really enjoyed all his work in general. So today, what I'm really going to read to you is a poem called The Forever Poem. And I'll try to slow down because today I've had my coffee. So I'm a little bit on, you know, speeding along, but I'm going to relax. So I want you to enjoy this poem as I have. The forever poem. Again, it's light, an unspoiled day. All the bad choices, the sins have not yet kicked in. The world seems to be running smoothly without me. The morning paper has not yet arrived to tell me what to be upset about. The flicker happily drums the rain gutter without my instructions. All praise to the rumbling force air furnace, the coffee maker burbling to life to a growling stomach of my cat. Black velvet nose prodding me for tuna. All praise to the self-reliant miracles everywhere spared in those early moments of befoldment from my stupendous power to screw them up. Soon, I would thrust my hand back into the watchworks of creation, gum up a dozen wonders. But for now, a determined ant trudges the ceiling above me. Tomorrow will come, and once more, the world will wait for me to sleep so it can heal. <laughs> so I really enjoy that poem because, you know, it sounds like me in some ways, that's how I feel. <laughs> but um, so that's what I love about his work is that he, it covers the gamut. I mean, his, his whole work, body of works is something I think everyone should check out because it's almost like a how to be a poet because he, he wrote about, so many different aspects. Some things, sometimes I wonder if this is about him or is a persona, something one else, but either way, it had a truth and authenticity that drew me to it, that made me see the commonality of our, of our, hum, our human existence. And so I, if you have not been um, a fan of David Manning, it's, I think it's because you have not read his works. So make sure you check him out. And, um, and I'm so glad that we had this opportunity to pay homage to him.
thank you, Celestine and Shannon. And um, I should uh, mention that Dave Manning was the only person I know of that three times won the North Carolina Poetry Society Poet Laureate Award in our annual contest. And also the only person I'm aware of who twice um, had the uh, annual anthology Pine Song dedicated to him. But he would never have struck you as a person who was seeking after uh, honors or kudos or recognition. Um, I remember meeting him for the first time, the first time I ever attended a North Carolina Poetry Society meeting. And I'm standing around knowing no one and uh, uh, wondering why I even uh, was there. And he came up and just struck up a conversation. And he was like that. He was a very thoughtful and intensely thoughtful person. But not only in the way that he cared about other people, also in the way that he was just constantly full of thoughts. So he overflowed with thoughts. A five minute conversation would be uh, fuel for a week of ruminations. And when you were with him, you just knew that his mind was ticking. It was like the camshaft and the valve lifters were going double time in that marvelous brain. And um, from a distance, he might seem kind of reserved. He would never push an agenda or seemed uh, intent on any kind of self-promotion, but then he'd get up to the lectern with that kind of quiet measured voice and read a poem and your own internal literary tachometer would just redline. So um, I, I think I have read all of his books and uh, he wrote, writes about uh, his younger days in California. Um, he lived in uh, West Virginia for a while. He lived uh, many years in North Carolina. He writes about science as a scientist. He was a scientist. Um, he writes about the emotional power of music. Uh, he was a trained classical tenor. He wrote a, about a thousand love poems. Maybe every one of his poems in some way is a love poem. Uh, so poignant, razor sharp, and as Celestine sort of implied, sometimes pretty wickedly, deliciously humorous. So I'm going to read the final poem in his final book, uh, Sailing the Bright Stream, which is from Press 53. It's a, a new and selected poems from most of his books. Uh, there is one book that's not collected in here uh, called Yodeling Fungus, which was um, his book of humorous poems, which can't be read on air. Okay. <laughs> but um, I'm going to read the last poem from Sailing the Bright Stream. Thank you, David, for leaving us your words. And this is called The Dance. I say yes to the tulip tree, dropping its cup of flowers, golden and green, and to the derelict Alanthus, breaker of concrete sidewalks, and to the sumac with its cones of fire. Yes, the white tails that float their magic then vanish far into the woods deep green, and to the mallard pair, duck and drake, that waddle up from Crabtree Creek, and to the earthworms they clear from our driveway. Yes, to the turtle, the red slider, that spring calls from the creek to wandering, the one I rescued from a storm drain and gave my blessing to, and yes, to that damn beaver that cut down the giant beach near the stream, my favorite tree, to the wetland, and to the trees he left behind. Yes, to the night's extravagance of stars, to Vega's frozen light, the lyre of the stars, and to the Southern Cross and multitudes of strange lights I cannot see, much less name so far below the horizon over Patagonia, all the way down to the pole. And yes, to the blessing of day and night, mates following each other, and to the contentment each brings in its own way, bright, then silent, dark. Because none of these I can keep. Yeah. 
Okay. They are not mine. Okay, and I cannot stop the music in the middle of the dance. So yes, to this morning rain carrying yesterday away. Thank you, David. I just want to encourage everyone to please mute your mics if you're not speaking. Indeed. Um, um, thank you. Thank you all so much for those beautiful readings and particularly uh, though each of you for sharing um, words that give us a picture. You know, this might this must have been quite a guy and I regret I didn't uh, meet him. Uh, several of you have put lovely tributes on the chat. If you don't know how to save your chat, uh, I remembered a little while ago, but I'm forgetting. But I'm right forgetting. Now. Ah. ah, that's not me. Anyway, um, we we can. Well, first of all, are there any remarks on what you just heard? Is there anyone who'd like to make a statement who hasn't done so on chat or or shared a reaction about David Manning or has something else they'd like to add? We do have a few minutes which is a thrill. Okay, like we're in the classroom and we're going to wait for the thinker, but David, Man, uh, uh, but David Radovich uh, will, uh, we're going to make a segue into the first part of our uh, poetry readings by our wonderful North Carolina poets. Um, I am delighted. Uh, David's going to do all the work. Linda is going to sit behind here and remind people to please mute when you're not on, including me. So uh, David, do you, are, is this a good time? Perfect time. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And I'm just, this is just wonderful. So I'm going to mute myself and be listening along with the others. All right. Um, thank you all for that wonderful tribute. Uh, it was certainly much deserved, and, and I liked David a lot and his work. Um, I was thinking uh, somehow, I guess maybe because of Shannon, that uh, we've had snow at, at, at Southern Pines when we had a, a Poetry Society meeting. I was at one in March, but I think this is the first time I can remember when we had snow pretty much all over North Carolina. I think we're all in snow today, which is is something special. And here in Charlotte, we have snow for the second time in a week. So um, that's, I don't know, it makes something special for us. Um, so today's session is called uh, Poetry of Provocation and Witness. And as far as I can tell, uh, Poetry of Witness, of course, goes back to the ancients. It's not anything new, but the term Poetry of Witness, so far as I can tell, uh, originated with Carolyn Forche in maybe in the 1970s. And um, in particular, I'm thinking of her book, The Country Between Us, about her time in El Salvador, which is a wonderful work. Um, but I have to say that the, the term, the poetry of witness has been sometimes misconstrued. And uh, I read, I've read some poems that read like, I was looking out my window and saw a hummingbird hovering. Um, which is certainly a kind of witness, but I don't think that was the kind of witness for Carolyn Forche was envisioning. Uh, I believe she intended the term to mean the poet giving witness to uh, social oppression, suffering, or injustice, um, social issues. Um, what I prefer to call poetry of social concern uh, ranges widely in the spectrum and deals with the world beyond the poet's self-focused sensibility. And uh, at one extreme, uh, this kind of poetry can be social protest poetry, provocation, outrage, and even sometimes uh, used as a weapon in the struggle against oppression. So that's one kind of, of, of poetry of social concern. But there's also the other kind of, uh, at the other extreme, uh, there's a kind of quieter form that involves empathy, testimonial, and lament, among other things. So uh, uh, poetry of social concern doesn't necessarily have to be loud and, and outraged, but it can be. Um, 
And I would also say, this is my own personal perspective, that this kind of poetry doesn't concern only humans, but also includes plants and animals, uh, the planet and the cosmos, that this is uh, uh, essentially poetry beyond the self, uh, concerned about um, the communities we live in and the world we live in. So today we're talking about poetry that engages with social issues, everywhere from empathy and concern to visceral protest and rebellion. And I think we're going to hear all of that in the poets coming up in a minute. Uh, if I may, I'd like to read one poem of mine. Uh, maybe this will set the tone or maybe not, but um, um, I'm sure all of you are, are familiar with the idea of the chosen people. Um, this is, of course, um, uh, dates at least back from uh, the Old Testament and the Israelites um, seeing themselves as God's chosen people. And of course, since in, over the centuries, many people have decided they're uh, the chosen people of various kinds. And in the United States, we assume um, we're God's chosen country, or at least some people do. Um, and so there's this notion of, of people, the chosen people. Um, I've always identified with the unchosen. And um, I don't know if that's because I was raised by a single mother, but um, this poem is called The Unchosen. We are the unselect, those not favored by any God among the victors. We are not asked to join a team. We lose so others may lord it. Our soil is stolen without acknowledgement so those expanding can feel gain. Our food tastes of leavings. Our blood circulates in dry channels. Sun shining on us is not golden, but a kind of glare seeing grief. Even at night, sleep is fitful. A mouse is stealing a last morsel, and the moon eats itself thin with plans for the full awakening. So let me turn now to our three, we'll have three readers this morning and we'll have another three readers this afternoon at one o'clock. And our first reader is Destiny Hemphill. And she's the poet and healer based in Durham. She was recently appointed the coordinating curator of community engagement at the Weatherspoon Museum at UNC Greensboro. Um, previously, she was an instructor of creative writing at North Carolina State University. Uh, she's the author of the chat book, Oracle, a cosmology from Honeysuckle Press, which was a finalist for Honeysuckle Press's inaugural chat book prize. In 2021, she was a ped pedagogy lab fellow at the Center for Black, Brown, and Queer Studies. She is a 2017 Kalalu Fellow and a 2016 Ameri Baraka Scholar at Naropa University's Summer Writing Program. She's had work published in a number of journals. She's also a Remote Poetry Coalition Fellow at Split This Rock in Washington, D.C. this past year. Please welcome Destiny Hemphill. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for extending this invitation. Um, and thank you, um, David, for that generous introduction. And thank you, everybody, for gathering um, today and allowing me to share space with you. Um, so to my understanding, there's going to be some time for Q&A too. Yes. Yes. I was hoping that each poet would read for ten minutes, roughly, and then we'd have time for at the end for questions and discussion and okay. comments. Okay. Great. Um, so I'll probably come in at ten minutes or less, and so there'll be even more time for questions. Um, so I'll share some work from um, a manuscript that I just finished called Mother World. Um, a devotional for the altar life. And in that manuscript, I'm thinking about apocalypse, um, not as the end of the world in any singular sense, but the end of a world um, and a world that's constructed by colonial brutality. And once those structures retreat and collapse, 
uh, what becomes possible in terms of structures of care um, to sustain life. So this is Apocalypse number 33, A Prophecy of Care. Here we got you. We look out for you. We always looking out. We see you because we be feeling you because you touch our hearts, you move us. And when you be gone, we notice and we be missing you. You ain't even got to worry. Ain't even got to worry when we indebted to each other indubitably. I'll take care of it, we say. We say, I'll take care of you. We be holding you. We behold you. This is our bond to each other. We bond it to each other. We bound up with one another and unbounded by each other. May boundless and bountiful with each other. May abundant through each other. We'll look for you. If they tell us to go, we'll stay. We'll look out for you. We ain't afraid to turn back and reach out for you. We'll turn to salt for you. You are kin. You are bond. You are covenant. This our coven. You feel how our reverbs, this ours, this right here, this here be ours. We gathering together to usher something altogether new. But we ain't new to this. No, we true to this. We've been new this, this mutuality. We've always been taught how to do this. You remember, you remember how your mama and my mama would be playing that game, but they would see who could pay first for the check. Or my mama would be buying just a few things for the house, but then your mama would already have her cash out to slide it in the cashier's hands. While my mama, while my mama was still looking through her bag and it was never about paying back, they could never pay each other back. It was just about giving because the giving felt good. So they were going to keep on giving. And what about my grandpa who had chickens, but would still trade grains and the soap he made for your auntie's chicken's eggs? See how we were already learning, already given, already giving what we need to be with each other anew. Listen, baby, this you can believe. It means the world, the whole world to be sharing another one with you. Thank you. Um, so I'll do two more poems. Um, and this poem is called, we ask Mama and M, where is the mother world? And it's kind of a reverse golden shovel. So instead of the um, end words of each line, reading a quote is the spine of the poem um, that reads a quote. So the, the first um, word of each line that's flushed to the left. And that quote is by Ruthie Wilson Gilmore um, talking about abolition, um, giving a definition. It's building the future from the present and all of the ways we can. We ask Mama and them, where's the mother world? Listen, it's in, not at, in the whistle and hiss, the steam of your breath as you chant. We ready, we ready, we coming, we coming atop of a jail building and ruins. Yes, it's in your breath and in the never dwindling kindle of your fingertips as you reach out and touch the hands of your kindred, the living and your dead, who keep you here, right here, where we offer ourselves as the remains of the remaining future. Keep breathing, don't stop now. Yes, in your breath and in your hands that fend off, defend us from the state that craves our death, seeks to snuff our breath, lick the bones, chew the sinew, and in the same hands tending the fire, tending to the tendons pulled in flight, to bedraggled roots of raised hawthorn trees, to the composting of our present, tending to the dream that what we need and what, the, and what others have believed to be found nowhere can be found in the now here, like in those moments you said, rent shouldn't even exist. Here's a, here's a little money for it, or don't got money for rent, but take all the food you want, or don't got food, but wrap yourself up in this. Or don't have anything to wear, but here's a card been thinking of you and a song written for you and a milkweed found by chance and the paper you've been wanting so you can write your mama a letter to say you're okay. Or here's a map of the hidden ways to get back safe. Listen, we've always already been molding and shaping, spinning and folding, birthing and sharing. Can you feel it? in our breath and in our hands, between us, we've got the mother world, the whole mother world, 
in our breath and in our hands. Thank you. And um, the last poem before questions um, is called In Our Own Names. Okra pickled just the way you like it in the jar on the top shelf. Oranges in the ochre clay bowl you made right there on the counter. Clove tea brewing stove top. And there's an orison that my mama taught me metronome against my oral bones orbiting around my occipital bones. Come through. Let's be each other's oracles. We can hold hands, craft a shrine in the gap of our palms, in the ocean of our breaths, at the shore of our oil shine flesh. Listen, this is my oath to you. I'm devoted to you, the people, my folks, my kindred, not to the state. And I belong with you, not to the state. Our love is ordained by the black ordinary in spectacle, our wayward way making. We are the more gathered together here in our own names, calling on otherwise, serenading otherwares, singing we already hear, so come through. Thank you. Thank you so much, Destiny. Um, would anybody like to ask a question or make a comment? You can unmute by pressing the space bar on your console. Hi, um, Destiny. This is Regina Garcia. This Hi. was absolutely wonderful. Absolutely. I can't even, I think I typed um, uh, like images I could lie down in. Uh, Oh, already, wow. always, already, always. And as you spoke, I, um, I don't know if you consider yourself to be an Afrofuturistic poet. I think that, you know, when we think about the concept of Afrofuturism, you know, our past and our future, um, it's almost like they, you know, we have this desire to have them find each other again. So that already, all, um, you know, already, uh, Piece just kind of really resonated with me. Um, uh, I just, I guess this is probably a, a very common question. Um, uh, who, what inspires you in your, in your, in your writing? What are you most inspired by lately? Yeah. Um, well, first, thank you so much, Regina, for that really generous um, and kind reflection back. Um, and I think you're already tapping on some of my influences, which um, are Afro, includes Afrofuturism, but in the way that you're talking about where there's not, um, temporality isn't separated neatly between the past, present and future, um, but they're always um, talking to each other kind of like in the Akan concept of Sankofa. Um, so looking back and, and moving forward at the same time. Um, I think that, one influence that always always remains is my mother um <laughs> and um i think in terms of her integrity um but also um she's a minister and so my background is is, is in the black church and i think that comes through my work um in terms of cadence in terms of breath um in terms of the the way um, language slides against each other. And then um, also what has been a profound influence or I guess compulsion lately um, was that I was community organizing between like 2014 and 2017. Um, and yeah, there was um, profound burnout. Um, that I experienced, but also, you know, the people that I was in community with experienced and um, writing as a way to kind of maintain a devotional faith that another world is possible, even when there seems like there's so much evidence to the, to the contrary. Yeah, thank you, Regina. Thank you. thank you. I think Linda had a comment, but maybe she disappeared here. Oh, she's Linda. 
Yes, actually, I thank you. I just told my husband, who was an English major, he should come in here. Anyway, um, I wanted to ask you, uh, Destiny, uh, to go back to the second poem you read. Um, I, I wrote down the words golden shovel, and it, the, you often repeated, listen, tell me, tell us again the structure of that poem. I, sure. I miss it. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, okay. What I can do is I can also send y'all a link where it's published so that um, that's perfect. See it. But um, basically, let me put the link in the chat real quick. So if people have the capacity to open it. Um, so in a golden shovel, um, which my other poet friends, um, please help me out if I get this wrong, but I think it's an invented form by Terrence Hayes, inspired by Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, and in that form, the end words have a quote and an issue, and in the original Golden Shovel is a quote by Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, this is kind of a reverse Golden Shovel um, in that instead of the end words, if you look at the spine of the poem, where it's you know flush to the left margin, you see, um, listen, it's building the future from the present in all of the ways we can. Yeah. Thank you. And, you know, the visual is going to help us too. So thank you so much, Destiny. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Uh, Destiny, does... Uh, Afrofuturism automatically um, equate with um, poetry of witness. Is, uh, would they? Is there a, such a similarity, an integration between the two? I think is what I'm trying to ask. Between the two, that it's automatically a, a, a poem of witness, or is, can um, Afrofuturism be entirely beyond that particular genre of poetry? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, so I think that Afrofuturism and poetry of witness has a lot of resonance with each other. Um, Afrofuturism, though, is, is kind of this cool thing where it's an assemblage. So um, it's an assemblage of poetry, um novels theory music and so like you know Sun Ra for instance or you know George Clinton in um in in, in, in parliament and so um it's this assemblage um it's not quite it can't be quite reduced to a framework it's not quite reduced to a genre but um it, it's very capacious but I think the way that I see a resonance in my own work is that um, Afrofuturism um, is thinking about a future where, you know, Black life can exist and thrive. Um, that's a corrective to um, the historical, you know, genre canon of sci-fi that oftentimes does not imagine Black life in the future, even as they may have racially coded um, plots where there's, you know, alien life that, you know, is enslaved or alien life that is um, holding captive human life. Um, and so in that way, um, because it's reimagining and intervening in, in terms of um, what the stories that we hear about what our future can be, um, and thus also reinterpreting um, what our history is, I see, I see a resonance between them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Joanne, do you have a question? Yes, I do, thank you. 
Um, the poems were just gorgeous. And uh, thank you so much for sharing them. And I think it's so important, um, this writing of the future as a positive thing, because like you said, people get discouraged and you know can't envision uh, uh, the future and 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 poetry such a your poetry particularly such a beautiful way of doing that i was wondering how you started writing and how you started writing these this sort of, of of poem and kind of maybe any changes and struggles and epiphanies that you went through in the process yeah thank you um so i began speaking pretty late um in terms of forming like full fully formed sentences and then when I did begin speaking people couldn't understand me um but at the same time my mom was teaching me how to read and so um she could while other people couldn't understand me my mom could understand me so she knew that I was able to read um I was able to do like basic spelling um and so what that created was that sometimes it was easier for me to write something than it was for me to tell people because if, some, if I said it, um, oftentimes I was misunderstood. People would get really impatient and frustrated with me. They would try to assume what I was saying and sometimes it was just absolutely wrong. And so that was actually my entrance into writing. Um, and doing that, you know, I, I started writing little poems and my first one was from Mother's Day. It was like, love is love, play is play, but most of all, happy Mother's Day. And that was in kindergarten. But I received such good aff affirmation. I was like, okay, like I'll continue this. Um, so <laughs> that's how I started. Um, I think in terms of the type of poetry that I'm writing now, I think the continuity is that it is um, very reverent and accountable to like my ancestors and in my the communities um, in which I'm living. And so I think that's the continuity in my poetry. Um, but I think that moment that I was describing in terms of community organizing, that was a really big pivot. Um, I think Previously, my poetry was thinking a lot about um, my lineage of inherited stories and, and working with those so like family oral histories. And then through organizing, um, I was trying to kind of like channel ancestral wisdom and thinking about the world that we want to create in the future. And so it's not, none of it's separate, it's just kind of like all these divergent paths, um, kind of from like a central node. But I'd say that's how I see the continuities and divergences. Thank you, Destiny. That was a wonderful reading and wonderful conversation. And I think um, you your work embodied for me a perfect example of, of poetry that links us to community and, and um, uh, the, the life and the world of of the world and the planet. So thank you so much. Thank um, you. Our next reader is Hannah Vanderhart, and she also lives in Durham. She has her MFA from George Mason University and recently completed her dissertation on gender and collaboration poetics in the 17th century at Duke University. She has poems and reviews published in a variety of places. Her chat book, Hands Like Birds, is forthcoming from Ethelzine Press, and her first book of poetry, What Pecan Light, was released in the spring of 2021 by Bull City Press. So please welcome Hannah Vanderhart. Hi, thank you and welcome everybody. Um, thank you, David, and thank you, Linda, so much um, for inviting me. Um, I have to say that I heard Linda's voice for the first time at the North Carolina Writers Network and just immediately fell in love with Linda's voice. And I didn't even, I had no idea who Linda was. I just, I heard someone say, oh, honey. And I was like, who is that? Um, so, <laughs> so it feels very good to be, uh, I was raised mostly in Virginia, but it feels very good to be more, a little more further south. 
Uh, my family is from Louisiana mostly. Um, it is such a, a pleasure and a joy to be reading After Destiny. And um, in fact, right when I realized the readings were about to begin, I got really like nauseous just because I think I got so excited. Um, it's totally like going to church to, um, to, I don't even want to say like to hear Destiny, like just to like be in the same room and space at the same time. Um, they're absolutely transformative of space and time, which is incredible. Um, so thank you, Destiny. I wanted to read a poem first um, from Glennis Redmond's What My Hands Say, um, which is a Press 53 book. So I love having a North Carolina Press book in the house. Um, and you might be super familiar with Glennis's work. I just discovered this book um, at the North Carolina Writers Network. I picked it up from the press table. So I wanted to read one of Glennis's poems in thinking about um, that, you, you know, individuality is, it's a myth that we're entangled with each other, that we're dependent on each other, um, that we come to poetry through each other that, I mean, there are just so many, I mean, I know that there are lots of times in the writer's life when you can feel very isolated and very unsupported. So I want to acknowledge that, but we really, really need each other. Um, so, and, I, and I'm thinking a lot about Audre Lorde's the, um, essay, The Uses of the Erotic right now, which I just reread in um, uh Adrian Marie Brown's uh, Pleasure Activism, which is a book I really recommend you read. Um, among other things, you get like beautiful new footnotes on Audre Lorde, which is like, incredible. Um, but thinking about what it means for society that does not build its systems on prop for a prop for the pursuit of profit, for the point of profit, but for the point of need. Um, so this poem is called My First Poetry Teacher, and it's dedicated and says for Carrie McRae. Teach, like the congregation at Bethlehem Baptist Church, yells, preach, and she did, said, poets look back, mine the memory, find the journey worth taking, don't dismiss the coal. Go down the dark shaft. Go down into the danger. Go down into the lives lost. Plummet. Clear the smoke. Wipe your eyes and the grime. Write. Polish the rock that made the past till all facets come to light, shine. Um, and I'm very, very invested and interested in documentary poetics. So I think that um, poem offers you one model, both in terms of acknowledging teachers and how we learn and in terms of what the work is like and that it can feel very dark, but it also can bring light to you. Um, so thank you. That was Glennis Redmond from What My Hands Say. Okay. Um, and I'm thinking a lot about witness and provocation. And I'm a Taurus and I can kind of lead with statements. Um, and my therapist is teaching me to lead with questions instead. Um, <laughs> so... Um, I am going to read um, a poem because I'm thinking a lot about everyone who's sick right now. And I'm thinking about those of us with chronic pain and aging bodies and just the state of sickness, political, I mean, it's everywhere. It's everywhere, right? And that's why joy is, joy and pleasure are really important works. And I just read the quote, um, that pleasure is not one of the spoils of capitalism. So thinking about 
how important that work is in your life. This is called The Light Has Always Been Going Down. And this is in my book, um, What Book on Light from Bull City Press. What? The quiet work of words. The doctors and the nurses fleet as thought. The bindings and loosenings. The basins with warm, clear water. The sage and pine of the clean air. The patient resting, positioned by a window. In the evening, there will be music, a small glass filled with something warm. The orange light painterly on a vase of tulips. The red ones seeming to leap out of the dark. A book lies nearby with a marker in it. It is good. The patient only puts it down to look at the light, at the light on the tulips. You can be sick, they think, and still the tulips, still the dark. The book is light in their hands. The room is warm. The aim has always been, do no harm in this place in the place of the book and the tulips. Even without visitors, the patient feels it. This place has many rooms, the patient also. They put the book, the tulips, the light inside them. The light has always been going down, the dark always full of it. Okay, um, and I'm, I have some kind of hard hitting poems in this book and the last one is, is, is especially hard. Um, and I am not going to, like, I want to read it, but I'm not going to read it today. Um, but if you're interested in thinking um, about uh, whiteness in the South and harm and perspectives and speakers and, um, I think of this, someone had posted on Twitter that about, I think it was Rachel Menes, the amazing poet. And they said that they've been listening to Jericho Brown answer questions. And someone asked um, if it was okay for a white person to write a poem um, with racial violence in it. Like, I'm not even gonna say the word that they were talking about, um, but violence around a tree. And um, Jericho Brown said, there are white people standing around that tree. Why don't you write a poem from, like, why aren't you writing about them? So, um, so thinking about positionality and who you're writing about, and um, but I just I feel like it's been, <laughs> it's been such a hard time, and we're all so tired. Um, and I really appreciate um, that the word softness came up in the chat around destiny's work, because I, I think that that is actually really, really important work is softness and tenderness. Um, and that, you know, there's no love without justice and there's no justice without love. It's not, you're not, I'm not saying that. Um, but I'm going to read, I'm going to wrap up with a soft a couple. Hmm. One or two soft poems. I, I'm not keeping track of the time. I was bad and did not look. You can read two. Okay. And then, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, so this is a love poem. It's called, It Was a Field Before It Was a Battlefield. And it's for my partner. It was a green before a fiddler stood on it and made mirth and never stopped playing. It was grass or maybe a green wood, maybe underbrush thick at your knees, unparsable. We have each taken something that belonged to itself first, something that was once a wide and open green. What turns red in spring before it greens? The red bud trees along the highway, also the human heart. Each glows lamp-like on the road to church, Virginia rolls with fields. And when I say it was a field before it was a battlefield, you say, and after. 
yes and after. Um, and then I'm gonna close with this poem called Confession. I have not been tender enough with the birds on my porch whose nest I took down, put back, disturbed. There's more. I looked at my family tree and wanted to cut it down, to saw off limbs, cut roots that go too deep in the south, the branches of the U.S. military, my father's year-long targeting course in Fort Leavenworth. I have put on robes and been a judge, sat behind the gavel and in the docks, sat in the courtroom seats where almost anyone can sit. I have been all of these places and persons all at once. There is a fable of the body where the members want to revolt against the stomach, but even a child can see it's all one body. At last, even the finger, the nail with its minor crescent can see, the chicks with their still closed eyes. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, for that beautiful reading, those lovely poems. We have time for a couple questions uh, or comments. Would anyone like to respond in some way? First, I would love to, um, to just say I love it. I was I was very surprised she's picked Willis Redmond's work because I love her work. We're doing a um, she's going to be on a guest on a, a new interview show we're going to be doing. Yes. Uh, and starting in February seventh, she's going to be our first guest. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, and I just want to know uh, how do you get drawn to her work? And how does that connect to how you want to show up as a, as a poet? Thank you for that. I'm so excited about the interview. I will, um, I'd love to get information on that. Um, I'm, I'm just always looking for new books. And um, I was at Press 53 Table and um, I think it was, um, I had been sent over there by the editor at Unicorn Press, who was like, oh, because we were talking about ghosts. I do a lot of like family, like digging up bones and ghosts. And um, I'm like, the, I feel like the family grave digger sometimes. <laughs> um, but the editor at, or the, the publisher at Unicorn Press was like, go over to Press 53 and ask for um, Jacinta. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having one of those brain like is it just sent a white just okay yes um go look ask for their book and I was like okay so I went over and I asked and they didn't have a copy but they were going to send it to me and then I asked a question which has now become my favorite question for editors which was if if you think I'm going to like this book what is another book you have like it that I can I would also like because the press the publishers know their catalog better than anyone else right um and so he handed me glennis redmond's book and i was like this looks great um and i loved it so um i mean i think and i and i really you know i've actually carried it with me to a couple readings um and read from it before i've read because it came out in 2016 which a seems like a really important year to be reading it and be a year that it really could have gotten overlooked because it was such a traumatic year for everyone. So, I mean, I'm a reviews editor. I don't, I think the books have eternal shelf life. Um, so I just wanted to like bring it back into conversation because some of the work, I mean, is just um, the blue bottles poem. Like I have a I have a bottle tree poem in my book and I was like, oh my God, yes, um, to this poem or um, bale, like I'm, you know, literally a hay bale. I'm so interested in poets who are writing about fields um, and um, her poem, Cotton Goods and Field Cotton are just astounding. So um, specifically as like a, a white Southerner, um, you know, I think looking for 
looking for the many, many narratives that I know are there. It's not, it's not that people are not speaking. It's that people aren't being listened to. Um, but, you know, I, I work in, I've worked in the past in my academic work with women's narratives. And there used to be this like, oh, women we didn't write then. No, women have always written. It's just, you know, we've been, they've been ignored. Um, and the same with black Southern women and femmes, like they've been writing, like, so go look for their work. Um, and it's every, you know, it's everywhere. So um, it's really exciting to see the North Carolina presses um, and, and who they're bringing to light. Um, thank you, Hannah. Uh, maybe one quick question and then we go on to our next reader. Um, yeah, very quickly. Um, and forgive me. Um, listen, I've forgotten and I'm out of touch with what is do documentary poetics and uh, a 25 word answer and direct me, please. <laughs> you guys are asking all these easy questions today. <laughs> After future is a documentary product, they're like, okay, uh, we got this. Um, a document, documentary poetics is poetry that works with a document. It's as simple as that. And it can be any kind of document. It can be an audio document. It can be a visual document. Like think in terms of like how we use the word narrative to apply to many yes, different yes. things. Yes. Um, I cannot recommend to you enough um, Susan Briante's Defacing the Monument which does so much with documentary poetics. Um, and she has like a bibliography in the back with a whole bunch of documentary books. Um, and she has all these exercises, these writing exercises. So if you're interested, if you like, you have your birth certificate and you wanna write a poem about your birth, you're doing documentary poetics. If you're using, you know, legal documents about someone's court case, you're, you know, you're doing documentary poetics. If you're using family photographs or your family tree, or like I collage um, my third great grandfather's Confederate application for pardon, that's a documentary. So all of that, all that work, it, it doesn't have to have um, the physical document, but it can. And, and you were a wonderful workshop leader and I appreciate at the North Carolina Writers Network Conference and I appreciated being in your classroom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was a wonderful reading and discussion. Our next reader is Lennard D. Moore and he's from Jacksonville. And I think most of you know him already. He's a writer of more than 20 forms of poetry, drama, essays, and literary criticism. Um, he's been writing and publishing haiku in particular for more than 20 years. He served as editor of All the Songs We Sing, celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Carolina African American Writers Collective, which was published in 2020. In 2008, uh, he became the first Southerner and the first African American to be elected as president of the Haiku Society of America. He is executive chairman of the North Carolina Haiku Society and founder and executive director of the Carolina African American Writers Collective and co-founder of the Washington Street Writers Group. He won the Sam Reagan Fine Arts Award for his contribution to the fine arts of North Carolina. Um, he's executive director of the North Carolina Haiku Society and uh, I can go on, he taught at North Carolina State. We were getting a lot of North Carolina State this morning. Um, and he also taught at North Carolina a and uh, and Enlow High School. He lives in Raleigh and teaches English and world literature at Shaw University. And uh, I could go on. Uh, he's lived in South Carolina, Virginia, California, and Germany. He is working on two poetry collections, a novel, short stories, a play, and literary criticism. So uh, incredible resume. Please welcome Leonard Moore. Wow, what an introduction, David. This might actually make 40 years I've been writing haiku. I think I will read a high boon uh, from the newest book, Long Rain. Okay. And I, I don't think I'd take time explaining what high boon is. I'd just say that it is a Japanese poetic form. Watery Tuesday. April 9th, 1968. I remember that ninth day, a learning day. We're lining up at the classroom door. 
not knowing what to expect, but obeying our fourth grade teacher. We love our teacher. She's the only white teacher at our school. If we get out of line, she'll say, bend over and grab your ankles. We don't want to feel the smack of her tan plastic baseball bat. We love to sing the songs in Spanish and dance in her class. Today we will walk single file, the straightest line to the cafeteria where the glossy wooden stage waits like the black and white TV. We watch Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s funeral. We weep salt water, keep sobbing until we return to class. Spraying daylight, a pot or pan bangs behind us. And I read a Tonka poem. Uh, that's another Japanese poetic form, but I won't, uh, as I say, go into these forms. And matter of fact, I write poetry in more than 30 poetic forms. Surging water seeps through the tall wall of sandbags, white body of light, golden rod on the hillside, tossing and shifty wind. And I read a poem from uh, my other newest volume, uh, Geography of Jazz. The, the, the one that I just read from uh, was Long Rain. American Jazz Coup, 96th Street Library, New York City. We sit in a hush so deafening, it tingles my ears for what will burst into talk, into poems. Now I wanna do something else. I wanna read a poem from when I was 25 years old to a poem to now, okay? So I won't say how long ago I was 25, but it was a long minute. I'm in my 60s now, that's all I say. A poem for Langston Hughes. You Langston, you black man who is waiting for our tomorrows not to be on the ground and lost to oblivion, whose African eyes have silk like a vault, whose metaphors live on, whose poems tremble the world like a great earthquake, whose spirits lift heads young and old, whose books will always be read. You who are not afraid to seek revolution, a revolution of liberation. You were not afraid to retrace the now, to show how stable your memory, how untimid your voice for your people, how brilliant you were. You Langston, you black man who is waiting for our tomorrows, not to be on the ground and lost to oblivion, whose sentient words have brought salvation, have led brothers and sisters to cast words upon page after page, create piercing poems and treasure their heritage. All oh, you black men insisted on electrifying the world when others sought to cage you like a bird. Always it is the rhythm of your words, jazz rhythm, stroking freedom in ears, burning in minds, so deep, so deep. That's one from when I was 25. Okay, uh, I just say this poem is titled, My Father Leaves for Vietnam. This particular time I went with my mother when she took my father to the bus station back in the 1960s. At that time, I remember you could not see uh, the soldiers or the, uh, the Marines on the bus. Uh, the windows came up instead of down. So all I remember is all those hands sticking out the window waving. So here's the poem, I won't say any more. My father leaves for Vietnam. When my father let loose my mother from his outstretched arm, pants, he stared into her eyes 
as if wanting to see his pain. I had never seen him cry. His eyes damned the water. I felt my mother's heart drumming in me. He looked down and whispered in my ear, I'll be back. Don't be afraid. Then he turned away. He boarded the Greyhound. I held my mother's hand and looked at him climbing the steps. He sat and hung his hand out the window. I watched the bus fade. I have never understood why he had to go. Although my mother cupped me in her arms as if she could still reach my father. Okay. Uh, that you should, do you have her letter? Mm hmm. Who is this? Okay. Uh, two more poems. This poem, uh, I guess you guys remember, I won't go into much, you can look it up. Uh, Black churches were burning in the South in 1996. That's all I say, here's the poem. Uh, bad times. Our churches are burning beneath locust black skies. Empty pews hiss the names of silent thieves. Cracking stained windows reflect the faces of thieves who haunt the rafters on rural southern roads. Shadows bow like Sunday congregations to peach preachers, holy ghosts and sermons. Our churches are burning. The graveyard spirits are quiet. Bats dip and swerve like flames. Our churches become charcoal aftermath and cornfields are full of smoke. The willows wail and weep. Ferns fan themselves. Wind erases footprints of thieves who stalk by night. Our churches are burning. No one searches the woods. Thieves slip in and out. No sirens scream. No alarms go wild. Our churches are burning. These are bad times. Bad times, bad times, our churches are burning. The bells do not peal. The covenant still speaks to our people's weary hearts. Now one more from, I guess I could say now time. Autumn 2020 for J.J. Shahuri. I want a North Carolina that sheds sustained racism like snake skin, rises from its tight coil into brilliant sunlight and embraces all its citizens. I want a North Carolina that pops the black head of unequal salaries like a burnt tipped pen, oozes away the wageless pus and grips all Americans. I want a North Carolina that provides bombs so palms can slather like shea butter, heal any festered sores, and lift all its citizens. I want a North Carolina that illuminates any dark crevices of unequal education, any overworn textbooks, maybe passed down any broken desks maybe tools too, and empowers all Americans. I want a North Carolina that beams the American dream like an LED bulb, maybe gleamy at times, shapes keys, assigns combinations for all its citizens. I want a North Carolina that speaks soft syllables of faith, love, kindness like a brother's keeper, like a good neighbor to all Americans. I want a North Carolina that reflects this rainbow of people, shimmers gold, orange, red, yellow leaves from coast to Piedmont to mountains and glimmers like coins available to all its citizens. Thank, Thank you, you Lenard. That, that was wonderful. Really appreciate that. We have time for maybe one question before open mic. So uh, does anyone have a question or a comment? 
um, for Lennard. I will. I would. For, I would like to ask a question. Me too. And I'll ask my question very quickly. I hope I don't know what his answer is going to be, but I see you, uh, Lena, as a very natural poet. That you're very observant. You're very uh, much a reporter, an interpreter, and a prophet, and a cultural provocateur. So, but you also a very disciplined craftsman. You know. So, how did you become? Did you decide, or what uh, came up in you for you to become the kind of poet? that you are now? Well, I've been writing a really long time. About 20 years ago at the church one day in my hometown, my hometown church, one of my homegirls who graduated about two years before me told me, I remember you were writing when you were little. So yeah, I wrote in school too. And in junior high, I remember a play that I wrote in class was acted out. And then I wrote poems all along. And then when I was in the military, I began writing poetry every day. I was in the military back in the 1970s. I was in the army. So I wrote every day. And then in the early 80s, when I started writing haiku, it's the haiku that makes you so observant, uh, attuned to your uh, surroundings, attuned to everything. And I think it's the uh, conciseness of language and the precision of imagery that helps with any form of poetry. And so hopefully, as Gwendolyn Brooks would say, I try to report or document uh, the world in which we live. Thank you. Linda, quick question from you. I, no, no, I just was going to say, Leonard, I appreciate that you, you know so many forms, the high bun and the tank, tank and so many. And I hope we will pencil Leonard in for the future to talk about poetic forms. And it may be 2024, but anyway, thank you. Wow, thank you. I'm, I'm honored and humbled. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank well, you. Thank you, Leonard. And thank you, all three, these wonderful poets this morning. This is a, a, a genuine feast. And we're going to continue this afternoon uh, with three more uh, at one o'clock. Uh, and we'll have more uh, fantastic poetry. Uh, but now I will hand it over for open mic. Yes, and so I'm just gonna jump right in. Listen here, this is just such a magnificent morning and we're indebted to all of you. Uh, there's no question about the serendipity involved in this. Anyway, so let's begin with any volunteers. You can talk about anything. I mean, you, your poem, you can share anything. But if you have a poem of provocation and witness, that would be lovely. Or if you have a poem about our 90th anniversary celebration. So who'd like to get us started? And you can simply pass the baton to the next poet who would like to share. And if any of our poets today just want to jump in there with one of their poems uh, early or late, that would be wonderful. Well, I guess I'll volunteer to go first, if that's all right. Thank you, Kat. <laughs> and uh, yes, Kat, of course. Well, don't let me just say Kat Beaudry is is a remarkable, another remarkable young woman. And she is the young woman who has the who is now and the agent for our uh, friend who is um, in prison for life. You'll have to help me. And and with uh, and working with him to for a, our program, which at this moment will be in September, but might be earlier. So, yes. Yeah. So um, I read a great book last year called Crimson Letters, Voices from Death Row by um, Tessie Castillo and four men on North Carolina's death row. I found out one of them was a poet and I befriended him and we are best friends now and we share poetry, our love for poems, um, you know, our personal lives. We've just connected in so many different ways. Um, if you're interested in reading his poetry, um, you can check out my website. I'll put it in the chat. His name is George T. Wilkerson. Thank you. And he is fabulous. He is just amazing and an amazing person as well. Um, so I've started writing some poetry about, um, you know, death row, the prison experience in general. Um, 
and just kind of the, the state of things right now. So in North Carolina, we are not currently um, doing executions. I believe that stopped in 2013, but it really depends on who the governor is. It could start up again at some point in time. So this is called pulling teeth. My sophomore year of high school, we learned about the Holocaust, traveled to DC and saw the museum for ourselves. Piles of faded leather soled shoes, jars of gold and silver teeth, fill teeth fillings, all the ways they stripped a human body of its valuables like a car on its way to demo. 18 years next month with a death sentence. Capital punishment with an emphasis on punish, not just off with his head, not just a hand escorting to gas chamber. Many go to solitary when they first arrive, splicing all connection to the outside, to people, to sanity. I imagine the guards leading someone in chains out of that hell for the first time in one year, two years. The feeling they must have of dragging this walking vegetable into population or whatever other cell they've been oublietted into, it's like fucking pulling teeth. One of the ways I know I've gained empathy, a TV show vampire decides to have his fangs pulled so he can be more human. The pity I feel when elongated canines rip out from root, the flinch from screen. 18 years and you hold a six of hearts to plexiglass showing me a way to conceptualize fate versus free will. It's still beyond me, like your hand held up, fingers flattened before I go. Your endless laughter when I tell you about the homeless guy I offered a loaf of bread to after he asked for a milkshake, though I could have thrown in cat food and ketchup packets from the glove box. Did you ever have things? Whether you like it or not, whether it was fate or free will, they de-teethed you. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. And um, I put a little note out there if you'd like to read. I see a hand, Carolyn Cotton. Carolyn, you're on. Carolyn, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it is Carolyn. It's great to be here. This is my first time with you all, and I've just moved to North Carolina to Greensboro um, in the summer. So Wonder. I'm going to read to you a poem called The Pity. It uh, appears in Silk Road, a literary crossroads. And there's an epigraph. Um, in 1990, 600 delegates from 20 countries attended a Congress in Amaata, Kazakhstan, to call for an end to nuclear testing worldwide. Later, delegates traveled to the desert village of Karaul, 30 miles downwind of Polygon, where the Soviets exploded nuclear bombs for 40 years. And so this poem takes place on that journey. We've gone to Karaul to visit the, fam the village, the people who live downwind of the nuclear test site, the pity. A dry, hollow wind tumbles across the step as we exit the buses. The air smells of dirt and despair I cannot touch. A hundred villagers with earth dark faces search ours for signs that we will see them. Fathers hold up grown children with hair lips, enlarged foreheads, shortened limbs, or no limbs at all. Mothers' backs are bowed as though carrying their sons who killed themselves when they learned they were sterile. Everyone is clothed in the dark mantle of mourning. Jal, someone says, la pieta, the pity. A cluster of teenage boys smiles shyly offers scraps of paper like bits of butterfly wings for me to sign. They huddle, eyes alive and curious as I write. Druzha, I say in Russian, friends, longing to tell them in their desert tongue.
Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much, Carolyn. I put something in chat and forgot to turn myself back on. We have several hands. I'm delighted. Carolyn, you can put take your hand down. And okay. uh, Jennifer Wise, I saw you earlier. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm going to read a poem called Inviolable Bridges um, that I wrote. It was published in Sparrow's Trill, which was by Minerva Rising Press, and it was Writers Respond to the Charleston Shooting. Okay. Inviolable Bridges. Nine good people were slain this week. A nation weeps in a sea of why. Innocence, they, like the children slaughtered in Birmingham two score and 12 years ago. Nine lives, nine worlds extinguished. For if to save a life is to save the world, then to end a life must be to end the world. One man, one hate sodded, nothing of a man ended the world nine times nine this week on our watch. We survivors joined in grief are left to bury the dead, to funeralize and surmise the why of it all. We shall bury the dead our dead, we shall fortify connections, our connections. Mm -hmm. Together with hope, we shall recommence, determined to build inviolable bridges. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that, Miss Jennifer. Uh, we'll have Joanne, then Regina Garcia, Joan and Elizabeth in that order. So begin Joan, Joanne. Joanne, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I'm really pleased to uh, say that I'm going to read a very short poem that is in um, my book, To Drink from a Wider Bowl, which um, won an honorable mention in the Lena Scholl contest, but is now being published by Evening Street Press, and um, it'll be out in April. So I will put that in the chat, and the poem is called Maps. Every home needs a map of the world. Hang it by the entrance. Bless it as you might a cross or a mezuzah when you come and go. Trace your finger across continents, not your own. Say names of countries whose sounds tickle your throat and move your lips differently from your own language. Be curious about who lives there, sharing seas and stars. Hope to meet them, fellow earth dwellers all can't calling this planet home. Thank you. You know, we can spend a lot of money on our books. All right, let's move along. I've got so many. And the next person I said was Regina Garcia. Good morning, everyone. Hey. Um, excuse my Christmas tree. Um, I, I, I've been in a something. I'm just getting over COVID. So um, just excuse everything's happened by now. <laughs> Um, thank you for allowing me this time. Um, I do want to make one statement. My husband is in the is in the room with me, and um, he wrote me a note, and he wanted me to say this. So before I read this poem, I am to say to um, uh, Mr. Le uh, Le Leonard Moore, uh, the timing, rhythm, and inflection at the end of your verses are similar to Martin Luther King. He was very impressed. Yes, so I just that. wanted to share that uh, with him as well. Okay, my poem is actually about Martin Luther King. It's um, one that I wrote um, uh, many years ago um, and it's entitled For Those in the Struggle. Listen, all ye people who are peoples who've come from earth and bone, who have worn sackcloth and ashes, ye and they who are full of blood and salted water that stream from the most convenient orifices, lest ye think that the struggle is yours alone, look around at the flesh that surrounds and know that we struggle together. For some among you will be led and some will lead as our ancestors were across the Ivory Coast and Jewish ghettos and Roman prisons, labor camps, internment camps, death camps, in the dens of lions or lying with the enemy they we that struggle and live and die and rise again 
Today, I think of a people who were in a great struggle, a great fight to stay free and then to stay alive and then to win a war and then to survive the faux freedom inflicted by another people who struggled with the fear of the newly falsely freed, tied them to trees, brought to their knees for an eternity until the God who saw the weeping and gnashing mixed up a recipe for a man who sought to free another man and woman, a man who knew that he was not greater than the son of he who made him, but through him, he, Martin Luther King Jr., sought to alter the struggle of those whose spirits were descended from the malnourishment of a diet lacking in justice, replete in exclusion and isolation from the dream of all of those who struggle, struggle to achieve, and lest ye flesh weary souls, sick with the rejoicing of the victory, forget the captivation, humiliation, emancipation, no 40 acres, just an observation. Segregation, degradation, king's motivation, some integration, lyrical, spherical, academic, vocational amalgamation, lest ye forget. Forgetting creates a monster, which is blind in its strike, unbiased in its venomous bite, despises the yellow, brown, black, and white cloaks in the tapestry of intemperate thought and speech. And I must stop before I say what I cannot. We're all in the struggle. Learn from the struggle of all, lest you struggle in vain. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. Most moving. We'll, and thank you, Miss Joan, you're on. And then I'm going to have uh, I, uh, Iris, Elizabeth, Gary, Grace, and if we can get Melinda in there, but we've got to move along. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> this won't take long. This is a poem of a different kind of witness, very different. Naked, a huge breast glowing in the sky appears to me as I near home a mirage of fiery, fleshy orange on a Monday in December. I have no poet's praise for it, only a woman's astonishment at a monstrous bitch of a moon, a crone's breast bared to the sky. Oh, okay. That's visual enough. Thank you. Next. Iris. I think I heard Iris, is that correct? There we go, I was muted. Thank you, there you go. I, I just learned something from Hannah today. Thank you, Hannah, about document poetry. I've never heard that before. And so I picked a poem to describe that uh, from my book, called Walk to Yesterday, a memoir and poems. And it's called, it's from pictures. So I didn't know I wrote a document poem. <laughs> Images of a girl who couldn't smile. She looks for the little girl in the mirror, dancing across the lawn in her purple pinafore, posed like a doll on a shelf, <clears throat> waiting for someone to come along and buy her so she can smile. Three women and a little girl share the same severe face, the same hard hands that washed, scrubbed, ironed the polka dot dress, dresses they wear only for pictures. The photographer got to say, geez, all dressed up and no place to go, her taffeta pita pan collared dress, a twin to the skinny Christmas tree burned out lights and drooping ornaments. Her flat smile and dark eyes know this will be her last memory of Christmas for a million years. Still a little girl, now in a body's and a woman's body, holding her one friend, a timid tiger. She would have preferred a lion who could roam and roar and really make her smile. She knows a slight smile is better than none at all. Now a mother reads a story to her children, the picture proving what she cannot remember, reading fairy tales, scary stories, 
stories about good little girls and boys, but never stories about a little girl who didn't smile. Now a woman in black kneels in a white sea of snow, touches the flat black granite headstone. Dead flowers lie over her dead son, a mime smile on her face. Thank, thank you very much, Iris. And uh, I'm forgetting your last name, but we, we're we very grateful for that lovely poem. Uh, Iris Llewellyn Angle. That's <laughs> right. I got it. Okay. And Miss Elizabeth, we hope you'll be on camera, but, you know, we understand. Well, you know, I'm still in my pajamas, so I'm not going to be on the camera. I mean, okay. yeah, but sisters. My kids listen. will my kids woke up at 5.30 this morning to go outside, so I'm kind of going slow. But um, I wrote this the other day after I dropped my boys off at school, and it's called uh, These Lost Birds. A torrent of wings beat the air above the intersection where Arby's and McDonald's face each other. Here, too, in the big lot's parking lot, you brood clusters searching. Can you not tell the difference in cold pavement in the winter sea? Does it not move differently? Are motor oil and leaked gasoline able to disguise as salt and air come across a great expanse? <clears throat> you scre your screeching doesn't belong here, mixing with the squeal of loose fan belts and the impatient beep of a second too long, running through the rectangular lines, screaming, go home, send you upward, only to land a small ways off panting now, tired and trying to move these dumb birds who can't tell this isn't their home. Hitting Highway 87, I lean in a hurry to go, hoping what belongs will follow me to the sea. Thank you, Elizabeth. And would you let us know your last name? Yes, it's Steiner. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that poem. We're gonna move along to Gary Phillips. Hello. Then Grace, then Melinda. Out of respect, I'll read a very short piece. It's called Sorrow's Kitchen. I remember sitting with my friends in my twenties in Appalachia. Our host was very old and blind besides, Madge but she knew every inch of her little cabin like a treasured text. We were young and passed around a question to know each other. What's the hardest thing ever happened to you? Madge hung her head and sighed. When the chestnuts died, they were my best and favorite friends. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have to bottle that accent, I'm telling you. Uh, it adds to your word significantly. And Miss Grace Ellis. And ladies and gentlemen, you may take your hands down and I see the remarkable Joanne Hoffman. I think we are gonna squeak in this even if we are two minutes late for lunch. Grace. Okay. Um, I don't know how I make myself go on the whole screen, but uh, this is, uh, a, a poem I've, I, I, I've written a, an essay and a short play about having gone to the last day of the Selma to Montgomery March, but I don't, um, I haven't tried a poem. So this is a, po a new poem I just wrote. The day before New Year's Eve, 2021, with Omicron rising, we venture out to run a few errands. The local post office will be closing soon. The lines are long as I wait my turn to restock our supply of stamps for my husband's project of late Christmas cards. The woman in front of me watches as the ebullient postmaster shows her how to cut up a big box to make a smaller one. Trying not to be too bossy, I point out that it needs a bit more tape, which he applies with a flourish. Now, what do I need? Some stamps. In sheets, I clarify. There are two choices. I point to the one with small balls spelling celebrate, he says cheerfully, 
as he rings up my purchase. I can't hold back. As I walk to, toward the door, I softly sing, celebrate, celebrate, dance to the music. I would like to say that the whole crowd waiting restlessly burst into song in four part harmony, but that's not true. Still, some chimed in quietly. Why do I remember that everyone there was smiling when I know for a fact that all our mouths were masked? Thank you so much. There's so much melody in there. And, and remember to, you can take your hands down when you've read now. Oh, okay. And I did see Joanne Hoffman. So don't, don't shy away from this. Melinda, you're on. Okay, I am going to read a pep talk poem. Okay, and it's called My Skeleton's Pep Talk. I do my best to hold you up. Even all those years you heard, don't hunch over so, stand up straight, throw your shoulders back. As if posture depends only on calcium, rich bones and attitude. I can't make every little girl stand ballerina straight. So much sadness gets in the way. Let's forget about roses stooped over in dry vases. Look at how birds stand with backs arched and proudly focused on being a bird. Hear the wren singing on the porch and using its skeletal gift at full throttle. It's not my doing alone. One day you'll shape yourself into the bird your soul holds. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Melinda. It's nice to have people write about your poems in chat. So each of you should check the chat to see what messages your, your fellow poets have left you. And uh, Joanne Hoffman, are, are you ready? I am here. Okay. <laughs> Thank there you, you Linda. I didn't didn't know if there'd be enough time. But yes, earlier, Dave um, earlier David expanded my view of poetry of witness. So mm -hmm. uh, more more in the uh, line of what Joan read, um, I decided to pull this more formal poem to share as a poetry as a poem of witness. Lament for the harlequin frog, endangered. You're no fool when it comes to climate change. You know that warming isn't always warm, that clouds as thick as soggy wool arrange themselves across the tropic sun, transform your days from steamy heat to slightly cool, clouds so drunk on vapor from your streams that they hang low to earth at night, a cruel trick to trap moist heat in boggy pools that teem with fungi, hungry for your dappled skin. Frog-infecting chytrid thrives in shaded days, spends humid nights in mossy beds, then spins its swimming spores to ground, where you, ablaze with brilliant paint, can't play the fool with fate. As fungus feeds, your breed disintegrates. Thank you. Um, I, I ad admire that it's very rich and dense and out of my, out of my areas of expertise. So it's wonderful for you to share that. Listen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have three minutes according to my clock. So if there is another, I see Bill Griffin's hand. Thank you. And I see, oh, Karen Stewart. So go for it, Bill and then Karen. Yes, on mute. Oh, I'm so happy to be reading before Karen because I really don't want to read after Karen. <laughs> so our our symbols and our metaphors sort of uh, sometimes define our thinking. What if we change our symbols and see if our thinking can change? So this is sort of a code switching poem called Sun and Moon or Sola and Lunas. What if she rises every morning, barely time to wash her face before packing lunches, wiping bottoms, shooing them to school and work, 
and the whole bright burning day is her and hers to create. What if she coaxes corn and beans up from earth beds, exhales the air of forest and field until every creature breathes, spreads arms to embrace overlooked green minuscules of the open seas? What if she makes noise in the cities, makes play and deals, makes music and clash? What if all great loud striving movement is hers to catch and hold and love and release into the world with her color and its heart and all stirring things feel her warmth and every person whispers in their soul, make me in her image, leaving him to own the night, tranquil, soft, luminous with her reflection, gentle from his face, hours that empty us and refill with silence. What if he spreads himself like a cool hand on a child's fever, listens to each small thing in his care, beetle grub shifting beneath bark, bat about its business, little girl breathing dreams in and out as ever. He embraces change, his countenance turning through the arc of contemplation, open to close, to open, always in light, but sharing it in cycles. What if he has no desire for burning, but only gathers the excellent hot bits of her day and guides them into their places among the whole, its darkness, its bright, both he and she, tipping the scales up and back, and all swelling green things and all slow crepusculars and nocturnals, all moving air and all resting stones, all women and men together reaching one single inhale, hearts joined to discover that solid, soaring, fearful, comforting, unexpected, ever anticipated, clear and mysterious fire. Okay. Moves right along. Great pace. Applause. Leave your comments. Karen, and uh, I'm hoping that Paul Jones will read something from his newest book, but I see Susan's fault also. So go ahead, Miss Karen. All right. So in keeping with the moon theme, uh, this is some pretty fresh ink uh, that happened the morning after what was supposed to be our most recent full moon in your place. Hoping to see you, I looked into your sky before gathering the comfort of my quilt, but you were already tucked into the solace of clouds among star dance, hidden with only a hint of your glow reflecting from snow on the ground, from the ice on the hollies, from the know in my heart that your fullness was on I heard the sing of your song and was filled by the prowl of your howl, by the moan of your lone wolf moon, and a smile danced the full of my face. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much. Um, Susan, is, is that correct? Susan? You're on mute, Susan. Thank you, I always forget that. I wrote this poem the first time after we had the big snow in 1996. And I have rewritten it a number of times and it seems appropriate for this cold morning. Okay. It's called Vivaldi in the Snow. I played my guitar on a cold winter evening, simple notes, chords barred. As the world turned white, six of us played Vivaldi. It snowed hard all night. Time goes by too fast. Days often filled with struggle. That night too would pass. For a few hours though, we played apart from the world and watched it snow. When I feel sad, old, I remember Vivaldi, guitars, snow, the cold. I can't think of a better thing to think about. On <laughs> I got the privilege of walking the, watching the dog walkers. Thank you so much. Thank Listen, you. We'll take another minute if there's someone who's just just really thinks they have a word for the day or someone who'd like to share something that's new or something veteran. And I see Paul, uh, Paul Jones has his hand up. Bless you. By the way, I want you to know how your information on chat enriches not just me, but everybody here. Thank you. Thanks. It's hard for uh, the poets to 
do chat to reply with chats or links to stuff. Yeah. So I try to look at the little thing I'm kind of good at. Finally, uh, it's a trial at called Erasure. An old man walking in deep snow has just begun to disappear. Is he someone I used to know? An old man walking in deep snow. I wonder how far he will go. I hear he built a home near here. An old man walking in deep snow has just begun to disappear. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, a lot of internal and all kinds of rhyme and mm -hmm. It's a saint. Thank you so much for sharing that. It is now uh, 12.04. I, I think we can break for lunch. Is that, it, and if we're all, uh, we can all unmute and say, uh, say a word, but we thank these open mic poets, but we thank our, just our formidable formidable host of poets this morning. Yes, I do have word that someone is going to leave or a couple of us have to leave. But look, there are some some wonderful poets who will be with us this afternoon. And I'm going to talk a little bit more, very little, but about LaVon is with us today. LaVon Adams from formerly from uh, the uh, UNC Wilmington, anyway, and she's going to be uh, leading one of our programs uh, in this in this year. So, anyway, Celestine, do you have a word or phrase or any? And Miss Karen, uh, we're the ones, and Mel Melinda, whomever, whichever one is ever you are going to stay around during our our break our lunch break until one o'clock when we reconvene and somebody will be here in the interim, should you want to stay. I just want to remind everyone about the, port, the Poets and Poetry uh, Matters. It's going to be starting on February 7th. Our first guest is going to be Glennis Redmond. I'm so excited about that. Uh, later in the month, we have another guest, but when they, I'll wait till they confirm for that. So I'll be looking for, you know, poets that really has a point of view and things they want to share and to kind of bring the importance of what poetry is because we're trying to not only celebrate our 90th year, we want to encourage other poets who may not know their poets yet to join us in whatever way they can. So uh, please stay tuned for that and I'm open for suggestions and uh, you know how to get up with me. If you don't, uh, I think you just go to the website and, and I think there's a link there, but I'll post my, uh, my email address also in the chat. But I've had, I've enjoyed so much all the poetry today and you guys have been really a great audience. I've been seeing all the smiles on your faces. It Absolutely. really gives me joy. So, yeah, just um, beyond my wildest dream, you know, and I'm one of those that secretly multitasked, not today. I didn't do it. <laughs> and my husband has greeted me, hey, this morning with, now Linda, I have some paperwork from your parents, right, who are no longer living, that I'd really like you to review. And I said, Okay, maybe I can do it. No, I didn't. Um, anyway, um, if I see that we have 49, 49 with us. I'm going to need to take a break. But let me just say this, and forgive me if I repeat. Celestine, uh, we have some initiatives this year that are going to be killer, right? And we are building on the, the, the heritage of the last 90 years. Somebody's got their uh, something in the background. But anyway, look, um, you can be part of the excitement in little ways or bigger ways. So if you decide that um, you might be able to contribute a visual element to the 90th anniversary celebration, visual on Zoom, something to tie it together, start thinking about it, right? Oh, Karen, you listen. And then the other thing is um, talk with Celestine. She has some positions uh, that she's looking to fill with, with shirt sleeve um, members, chairs or shirt yes. sleeve, shirt sleeve board members. And I- Yes, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And we say that because we're a hard working gang, you know, we are. Um, oh, I know what the other one was. 
I said it before, but if you have even the faintest relationship to Hillsboro, if you've ever been in Hillsboro, as uh, Dr. Bill Griffin said about uh, when he was a, a young man, and I don't know if he was a resident, but we have this opportunity monthly to have a poet in person right now, in person, to be on WHUP FM radio with the charismatic Bob Bertman, B-U-R-T-M-A-N. I call him neighbor Bob because he is the neighbor of my adult son and his wife, but he's a remarkable, remarkable broadcaster. He wants us there. He doesn't want Linda matchmaking. He wants you to call him directly and he will put, now he didn't want a deluge, but I know it's not going to happen, but call Bob Bertman at WHUP TV uh, FM and tell him that, you know, if you have a connection to Hillsboro or if you can make one up poetically, that will work. Okay. So is there anybody else who wants to, hey, listen, there are so many wonderful books. We can spend a lot of money this morning, but what else do you want to share? Iris Llewellyn, Angle. Unmute, Iris. Unmute. There we go. Um, I would just hopefully someday soon we can all come back to Weymouth in Southern Pines. Sure. I miss you all in person. Where do you live, Iris? I live two blocks from Weymouth. Oh, well, and look at our, someone, at, Celestine can speak, but we addressed this last night at our board meeting. So don't think that it's not on our hearts and minds. Yes. You, know, wonder... as, you know, as is a, a future where we make other visits in person, but. Um, Weymouth is celebrating their 100th anniversary and they have 100, 100 activities. And I know the North Carolina Poetry Society is a big part of that. So. Oh, definitely. And I, I, several of us read the news from Pat uh, Riviere Seal, and uh, I certainly would like to have a visual link to these significant anniversaries, and we can best do that if we have collective Zoomed or telephone connected minds to do that. So if anybody's, if you're looking for a way to, to be, to, to contribute to something that honors both, that would be appreciated. I, I do want to note, Karen Stewart, you know about the Fiber Arts Guild in uh, Chapel Hill, which has their 50th this year, 50th with Fiber Arts, and they are doing individual squares that pay tribute to that. There are artists among us, hint, hint, some that, that, that anyway, we could do some visuals, uh, even though we're separate and apart over the coming uh, 10 months or so. Now, I like other, that. other news, other news. Regina, other news. Leonard always has something amazing coming out and Leonard needs to teach not just a workshop on form, but he needs to teach a workshop on marketing, right? Public relations. He's just as good as it gets. It was absolutely wonderful. And 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 actually it is so funny because my husband, you know, he he often does not comment. <laughs> <laughs> but he he was I was like oh my gosh this is it 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 he took me back Leonardo are you still up here I'm here oh, okay yeah. I just want to make sure you hear what I'm saying <laughs> <laughs> you took you you really took it it took me back to uh, my childhood I grew up my mother was a librarian oh um, so okay. so all just throughout my childhood we always attended. Uh, these different, you know, cultural ceremonies. And if you're, if you're, if you are black and you are a, 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 an artist of any kind, a poet, a singer, or whatever, you are being called on by your community to do these things in different 
in different places. And many people never, you know, you, you may, they never, they might not ever be known on a, on a, on a national or international scale, but community poets and, and, and people who are able to uh, encapsulate aspects of our culture and bring them um, to these places are just, uh, just such valuable um, repositories within the community. You brought me back to so much of that. Um, uh, it just made me, you made me feel at home. Wow. And I just wanted to say that um, to you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. yeah, Lenore, hearing you read is like going to the best church service I've ever been to in my life. Wow, you so, oh, wow, so kind, so nice. Well, you know what? You know, like the Williams Brothers uh, gospel song says, I'm just the nobody yes, sir. trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. Huh? Yeah, I'm telling you. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay, Linda, stepping away. The others of you are on for a few minutes. Thank you. Oh, sure. Yeah. So just so everybody knows, we haven't gone haywire. This is lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't just veered from the program. This this is the program. So it's kind of free talk, sharing. This is our, our version of uh, community. This is a great time to this is a great time to remute yourselves. This is a great time to remute yourself. And as I was saying before, we have a wonderful announcement about something that has happened that is so great for the North Carolina Ports Society and for North Carolina Ports, period. And that I really want to just share that with you guys. And I want Bill to really go into details of what we have put, got our hands on. Bill, I don't know why, but you're muted. Bill, you're muted. I cannot hear you, Bill. Why am I, can't I hear you? He's muted. Now, how about now? I had to use a different microphone. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Yes. So, um, Yes, this is a pretty amazing announcement. Um, this, uh, this winter, without really any preamble or awareness that this was going to happen, we were notified by the estate of Dr. Uh, Judith Beal that we had been named for a bequest in her will. So Dr. Beal um, was a member of North Carolina Poetry Society for many years. Um, as her health failed over the last few years, she has not been a member, but she grew up in North Carolina. She um, uh, got a degree from UNCG and then uh, moved to California, got a doctorate in physical education, came back, taught in Virginia for many years. And during all that time, she stayed in contact with the North Carolina Poetry Society and uh, with poetry in general. And so um, some of the other um, recipients of bequests from her estate include the Fred Chapel Creative Writing Program at UNC Greensboro. So uh, we received a check about a month ago for $163,000. Wow. So, okay, get, get back up off the floor. So um, last night at our board meeting, we had a long discussion about this and we have created a committee to decide how to approach this large bequest. It basically uh, almost doubles the uh, uh, net worth of the North Carolina Poetry Society. And so over the next month or two, we'll be deciding um, how we wanna put that to use. Um, but certainly we anticipate that we want to <clears throat> look at all our programs, all the benefits to our membership um, and enhance those in every way we can and uh, how we can be good stewards over this money so that for many, many, many years it will serve the Poetry Society and allow us to reach out around the state and bring our mission of expanding the appreciation and craft of poetry to every corner. So um, uh, we have a, 
created an ad hoc committee to discuss this. I'd really kind of like to have one more member on that committee. If you're interested in being on that committee, which will involve a lot of email meetings and probably some Zoom meetings, um, you could uh, send me a little note in the chat um, and I'll pick somebody uh, with Celestine's approval uh, to add uh, like an at-large member to our ad hoc committee. And then we'll get started thinking about how to spend the money. <laughs> so um, does is there anyone there who actually knew Dr. Beale? Um, again, she was a member of the Poetry Society till about 2012, but I never met her, never uh, saw her attend a meeting. Um, so this is the other bit of kind of cosmic connection there. She was uh, born and grew up in Elkin, North Carolina, where I live. She graduated from Elkin High School, and her dad was a family doctor, Dr. Seth Beale, who retired about two years before I moved to Elkin in 1981 to become a family doctor here in town. And so I had a lot of patients who had been patients of Dr. Seth Beal. I never met him either. He passed away before I moved here. Um, but uh, so I don't know what that means in terms of um, cosmic amazingness, but just really a little special. background. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Anything else, Celestine? No, and on with the show. <laughs> okay, and thank you. Hey, listen, that's just in, listen, these bequests, something like this is just beyond our ken, right? And we, we can be good stewards. So if you have an idea for something, uh, some use now or in the future, your, Bill Griffin is your guy. And now David, David and our poets uh, and. Well, welcome back everybody from the lunch break. And uh, we had three wonderful poets this morning and we have three more wonderful poets this afternoon as we continue our celebration of poetry of provocation and witness. Our first poet in this session is Shannon Ward. You heard her earlier read a poem by David Manning. And she was raised, I get this from her, she was raised in a renovated slaughterhouse on the outskirts of Wilmington, Ohio. And she is the author of the poetry chapbook, Blood Creek, and a recipient of the 2020 Inez Easley Educator of the Year Award from the Fayetteville Cumberland Human Relations Commission. She won the 2016 Foley uh, um, Poetry Prize, the 2016 prize in Southern Poetry from White Oak Kitchen, and a 2013 Nazim Hikmet Poetry Prize. So she's won lots of prizes, and she's won a number of grants. She received her MFA in Poetry from North Carolina State University, another um, North Carolina NC State graduate, and her work has appeared in a variety of journals. She is the executive editor of Longleaf Press. So please welcome Shannon Ward. Thank you, David, and to everybody here. Um, it's such an honor. Um, so I'm going to be reading a few poems from Blood Creek, which is the chat book that I published actually through Longleaf Press before I took that over. Um, I started with Longleaf when I was an undergraduate. And around 2006, I think, I became an intern there. And then in 2010, I went on uh, as faculty at Methodist University, and I was an assistant editor for a number of years. Robin and Mike, who used to run Longleaf, published this, this beautiful book for me. And then in 2020, when Robin and Mike retired um, early due to the pandemic, they handed the press over to me, and I've taken it independent. Um, and Lennard just joined my board. So um, we're working on some really exciting projects. Uh, we're going to be trying to put together an anthology of military related writing on the theme of healing. And so please be on the lookout, join our mailing list at longleafpress.org and be on the lookout for a call for submissions soon if you have any military related writing that you might like to, to share. 
Um, so this is the book about that renovated slaughterhouse that I grew up in, uh, in, in the outskirts of Wilmington, Ohio. Um, I also grew up in a family that was marred by incest and domestic violence when I was uh, quite a little a child. Uh, and so um, my older sister, Chelsea, she uh, was the primary victim of that abuse. Um, and as often happens in families where there's a great deal of shame and um, things like that uh, revolving around incest and abuse, rather than talking directly about the problems, um, what we did was <laughs> we told ghost stories and we talked about the butcher who had built our house at the turn of the 20th century um, back when there were no health codes to say where they could and couldn't drain the blood. And so the butcher drained the blood in the creek that ran around the little valley where we lived. And that's how uh, Blood Creek got its name. It's actually called Lytle Creek, um, but that's the locals called it Blood Creek for that reason. And so Chelsea used to tell me these sort of terrifying ghost stories. She was seven years older than I was. And um, she, unfortunately, when I was uh, 14, was diagnosed with terminal adenocarcinoma of unknown primary. And she passed away when I was 16. And so I was left with a lot of her stories and a lot of my own memories and a lot of things to try to reconstruct and kind of cope with uh, in terms of finding some way to deal with these stories that I could live with in, in a way that wouldn't destroy me. And so for a number of years, I tried to write um, a poem based on the ghost stories that she would tell me about this butcher. And uh, eventually I, I figured out a way to do it. It was, that was, this is how I came around to form poetry. Um, so this is a Terzanelle, very similar to a Villanelle, but without the rhyme scheme. And it's called The Man with Red Eyes. Each night the butcher rises, soaking from Blood Creek, and sloshes back through the woods to our house. His red eyes watch through the windows while we sleep. Smoke rises from my sister's mouth as she speaks. He froze to death, drunk, chopping wood. Yet each night the butcher rises, soaking from Blood Creek. This is the story she tells instead of the secret she keeps, the black spot lurking at the back of her throat. His red eyes watch through the windows while we sleep. Soon, she disappears in a fog of blue smoke, weeks that cloud into years, while still each night the butcher rises, soaking from Blood Creek. So when we wake in the night, we don't dare peep outside and we don't dare keep our bedroom doors unlocked. His red eyes watch through the windows while we sleep. I can see him even now, a red streak, sneaking through all the doors of my dreams. Each night the butcher rises, soaking from Blood Creek. His red eyes watch through the windows while we sleep. Um, so uh, the next poem is actually a villanelle. And uh, it's one that I wrote after having a conversation, a phone conversation with somebody at the Kettering Police Department um, in which I learned that in cases of incest, in Ohio in the 1980s. And I actually believe this is a practice that is still quite common today, not just in Ohio, but in other places. Um, so when you have cases of incest, it is often left up to the non-offending spouse, whether to press charges or request that the offending spouse or partner um, receive counseling in lieu of pressing charges. And of course, in instances in which the non-offending spouse is financially dependent upon the offending, partner or spouse that um, creates a, a sort of impossible uh, conundrum. So this is a poem I wrote after uh, having that phone conversation. It's called The Last Vacation. And it has an epigraph by Theodore Rethke from my Papa's Waltz, uh, You Beat Time on My Head. Okay. Her husband has taken the children swimming. She tries to speak, but her mouth is filled with coins. She washes them down with vodka, vomiting. She knows what it means to dream of sinning. She's the mother of four beautiful boys and her husband has taken them swimming. They open each book and read from the beginning. A middle child steals pills when he outgrows toys. He washes them down with vodka, retching. 
The oldest gets some kind of cancer stemming from trauma to brain, to spine, to loins. His mother has taken the children swimming. The sea is everything you cannot say, brimming with plastic jellyfish bodies and coins. She washes them down with oil, vomiting. There are photographs of families grinning in the papers, mother, fathers, girls, and boys, but someone has taken the children swimming and washed them down without wretching. Um, I think I'll just do a couple more. Um, this one's called Butcher. How could he have ever been satisfied? The sharp steel pressed to the pink skin of the hog's throat. One quick slit and then the shrill squeals screeching halt. How strangely silent it must have sounded before the last hot breath bubbling with blood fell into the bucket below to be carried off with flesh dripped bones to the creek behind the house. Perhaps pouring slowly, he found himself consoled by how before the color bled to a dull red cloud, the blood looked like a hundred satin ribbons floating downstream. And to see those bones sink, what a relief it must have been. Um, and last, I'm, I'm gonna try to bring it up a notch because I know it, uh, it gets a little heavy. <laughs> and I, I went to a wonderful panel one time um, with the poets Michael Affle Weaver, Weaver and I think Katrina Vandenberg was on it and they talked about levity and gravity. And when you have a lot of poems that are a little intense, you, you know, you want to try to create some peaks and valleys. So I'll try, I'll try not to end on such a dismal note. <laughs> um, so this one's called Stray. If the breadcrumb trail of relics I've left along America's coastal highways somehow resembles my concept of self, then the discarded coins and stray earrings shine wholly under empty hotel beds and light sliced beneath each door I have opened and closed like a nocturnal bloom, the moonflower, the Nicotiana. And perhaps the bed pillows still bear some impression of a smoke-colored amulet I left once by a nightstand in New York City. The black-rimmed glasses abandoned in Portland, the long blonde strands lost on islands named for forgotten saints. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon. That was wonderful. Thank you. We have time for a couple questions um, for Shannon. Does anybody have, or comments? Anyone want to respond? I, I, I would love to respond that those poems were so moving. Oh my goodness. Um, I, I would, I'm just curious about your process for, for maybe for selecting the forms or just if you could talk a little bit about how you come into the poems. Yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, I was very resistant to form for a very long time. When I was an under, or, well, when I was an undergraduate and even when I was a graduate student, um, <laughs> I studied with John Bellaban and he gave us Lewis Turco's book of forms and we had to close our eyes and open to a random page, put our finger on the form and then we had to write a poem in that form. And of course I got the crown of sonnets <laughs> and I was like, there's no way. I still owe John Bellaban a crown of sonnets. I never wrote the crown of sonnets. And so I just, you know, I was a free verse poet through and through for many, many years. But when I um, was trying to write the poem about the ghost story that my sister told me, the, the man with red eyes, I tried to write that poem over and over for five or 10 years and really never got it right. And then I was at the Anderson Center and I was just trying to kind of get into the writing process after a long year of teaching uh, and I thought you know what let me let me try it you know let me go back to Balaban's advice and let me try this as a form poem and I found that it worked and then I was like fine fine I'll come around to form but I really didn't want to for a long time but I think that the constraints imposed by the forms when especially when you're dealing with subject matter that is so explosive um, you know, personally, it's the constraints imposed by the form um, make you can contain it and make you contain something that's very hard to contain. So I think that that's uh, why I finally came around to 
formal verse. Um, and my, my process is messy. I always write on paper first, and sometimes it takes me many years before I get a poem right. I would like How about to start. another question? I have a Hi, question. Liz. Shannon. First of all, uh, hi, Shannon. I'm also from Ohio, oh. up north, Norwalk. But I also have had the similar experience of what you're writing about. And I just want to tell you, I know it's, uh, <clears throat> it's very difficult to, to write these poems. I started writing poetry as a way of expressing my grief of the death of my son. But then I found as I wrote more and more poems, I started going backwards or back in time and started writing some poems about the experiences that I had. So I, I just wanted to thank you for, for sharing that. And, and we're also neighbors now because I'm in Southern Pines and you're in Fayetteville. So let's get together. <laughs> and um, thank you so much. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. And I'm going to yeah. get your book too. Oh, thank you. Yeah, available on lonelypress.org. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that for me, uh, it helps that I was dancing around this subject matter for so long. For a long time, I didn't actually realize that when I was writing the Slaughterhouse Poems, I was writing about the, ch the childhood abuse. Um, and I also, you know, I decided to stick with it, even though the subject matter is difficult, because for me, when I came across works by Affin Michael Weaver, works by Dorian Locks, works that deal with this very, very personal and very intense subject matter, um, it was something that brought me a great deal of consolation and uh, made me realize that I could take these things that had the potential to really be psychologically incredibly damaging and turn them into something productive that could help me to transform my own narrative and could also maybe help to give other people um, just the, the knowledge that they're not alone because the subject matter is so often not discussed and um, the power to maybe speak about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, as a poet, as our poetry and as we as poets, I think that's the, the message that we have to, to share with the world. Yeah. Um, we are not alone, that we, we all have had different experiences as we've read, as we've heard today. Um, and it does help us to, to read those and to understand those and to share those because it helps all of us. So thank you. So one quick question from Liza. Um, yes. Hi, Shannon. Um, I just thought your work was so powerful. And I just wanted to ask, like, you know, and I'm sure that it is reaching, you know, a lot of people as far as like helping them also maybe feel braver in their own stories. And so I just was going to ask if you, um, when you published it, did you feel a sense of, um, you know, like, it's out there, like fear, how was your family's response? I mean, if it's too personal, you can always say no to my question. I just was kind of wondering, like, you know, how did, how did your, the people who know you respond um, and have other people who've read it, you know, who've had maybe similar situations been receptive? Yeah, so um, I hesitated for a long time to publish the manuscript. Um, and eventually I, came to the decision that I was holding back on publishing it to protect somebody who had really never protected me and that that wasn't a good reason to not publish the work. And so I went ahead and proceeded and published it. And the responses um, that I got were really varied uh, from different family members. You know, my mother has been incredibly supportive. Uh, she's fabulous. Um, but other family members, you know, I found out some people were mad at me, uh, and they got over it. <laughs> they did, um, you know, years later. So some of my family members didn't tell me until years after I published the book that they were mad. Um, but I think that it's the kind of thing that prompts discussions that are necessary and that are difficult and that, you know, had needed to happen for a long time. And so even though the responses that I got were mixed and weren't 100% supportive. I think that it was, the publication was justified and that um, the people who had a difficult time with it eventually understood that. Thank you, Shannon, that was amazing. And uh, I really appreciated your use of form. The discipline of that is, is wonderful. Our next reader is Sheila Smith McCoy who is founder and principal of Smith McCoy and Associates. 
She's a poet, literary critic, fiction writer, and documentary filmmaker. And she also works in humanities bioethics. She received her BA in English from NC State University. That's another one. Uh, her Master of Arts in English from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and her PhD from Duke. So she's all kinds of colors of red and blue. Um, her critical and creative work has appeared in numerous publications, including the critically acclaimed Schomburg series, African American Women Writers from 1910 to 1940, and many other places, too many to list. Um, she is co-author of One Windows Light, African American Haiku, an award-winning collection written by the five poet, five black poets. Um, her poem, Their Children's Children, garnered her the 2020 Muriel Craft Bailey Poetry Prize in 2020. Her collection, The Bones Beneath, was selected as a finalist in the 2022 Press 53 Award for Poetry. Um, prior to becoming a consultant, she was a higher education administrator and tenured faculty member at several universities. Um, she most recently served as provost and vice president for academic affairs at Holy Names University. She is a proud native of Raleigh and now lives in Oakland, California, but I believe she's on with us today from across the country. Please welcome Sheila Smith McCoy. I am most fortunate this section and Shannon, thank you so much for sharing with us. Have no power. Our power has been out on this morning, so hopefully uh, the phone will sustain and all will go well. I'm going to start with tribute for my, um, uh, for those of you who have heard me, it's called Your Times to Charm. And I will give the inward trigger warning before I start. It had made the first page of the newspaper. City of Raleigh hires first Negro non custodial employee. He sat in the drive through window of the municipal building, cashiering and representing the race. She took them all water bills, tickets, checks, and cash and folding money. Accustomed as she was to their surprised smiles, she noted the slight hesitations and the averted eyes, the wonder of her blackness in the white spaces of their minds. The day he came, she saw his persona mimicked in the wasteful roar of his truck, of its largesse, a half ton more than anyone needed to have to drive to town to pay a bill. She recognized in him the diehard cracker look of the farmer whose land her parents sharecropped when she was a child, and the look of wild abandon in him when they had picked up and left after all he had done for them. I can pick your payment here, sir, she said and a voice that rivaled honey for its sweetness. So when he put nothing in the drawer and said instead, I don't give my money to no niggers, she had already started to smile. She directed him politely up to the second floor. And when he left the truck in the no parking zone, she quietly picked up the phone and informed her favorite policeman that there was a truck parked in the no parking zone. When he came back to the truck, he cussed the ticket and walked back up and again asked, despite the word cashier appearing in big black letters above her booth, where he could pay that ticket. I can take it right here, sir, she said to his reddening face. But after taking the time to remind her of her niggerdom again, he went back upstairs. Having taken a low lead in their racial dance, she called upstairs a second time and in a smiling voice suggested that the officer come right down. That second ticket glowed in the afternoon sun, and she waited until the third time when he walked up to the booth and gave her his money, and she wasn't a nigger anymore. Just around the bend of the noose, time is unlinched, it drifts, drifts sweetly by. That poem's a high boom, which of course ends with uh, a wonderful little poem. The title uh, poem that I'm about to read now is the title for my section, Bones the Knee That Still Looking for a Home. <laughs> Oakland, 5 2020. The street lights down onto its masked faces of a shop called Twilight Zone, left untouched. Starting at Broadway and 14th, gaping window scream, it is way past time to remember the too many and the too long. Black-owned business signs and paint captured in graffiti. 
be okay, stop killing us, captions for the heart of seeing. There are names for every alphabet, A for Ahmad, B for Brianna, empty paint cans, discarded cardboard signs. We insist on safe passage beyond the needs of whiteness and its sympathizers. A man from Lebanon asked why I was taking pictures. Don't you think this is wrong? These windows are expensive to replace. And then he talked about his father, an educated man who had been forced to serve the British. The homeless white woman nailed to her last night got scared. And when she saw me, she said, yes, yeah, sister, you got to get it before they clean this shit up. She had a blue beaten suitcase. There was a mural in progress. The artist had already drawn rest in peace and giant red letters. Every other week, a black person has been killed by police in the stolen land while others debate what lives matter. Shattered windows in the building where I used to live, the storefronts on the street level still unrented. It was a forget me not moment. When I close my eyes, I can still hear George Floyd. Like when the bones beneath the routes of slave ships still call for Yima Yah. And that poem, of course, is based on the wall and a Broadway period of protest. I'm going to read next a uh, poem that won the Eurocraft Bailey Award for their children's children. This is dedicated to a woman who was lynched along with her son. Her name is Laura Davis. It's dedicated to Laura Davis and the other women who died at the hands of those unknown. For class, I placed seven tissue boxes in the room. I spaced them carefully, mindful of who sits where. My students have been with me just long enough to settle into habits of being in my class the silent ones, the talkers, and the one who sits over there, careful to say just enough, though I noticed that her perfectly preserved books have never been opened. In an email last night, a reprise of the one from last week, I have warned them that this day could be triggering, and because America has not prepared them, I must. I start the loop of Billie Holiday's version of Strange Fruit, a perfect song for this awakening, a song with its own miscegenations, its own history dipped wrapped in its singular bluesy Jewish white black rhythm. The website that they should have but have not read, reviewed before class is already open. I start the class precisely on time, allow the lynching images to flash on the projector screen on their consciousness. Mindful that these millennials, despite the bubbles in which they initially hold on to, are here to save themselves. Save us. I watch as the thoughts of instance fall. The last I saw Billy on that strange and wait. I hear the silence of my black students. And I walk behind the woman, supporting them with my presence. The other students work through the textbook stages of grief, lingering a while on anger. They don't know, could not have known. As I eviscerate their logic, the one with the perfect books raises her hand and quietly says, these things, and her voice breaks. Four heartbeats. I watch the progress of just one of her tears and wonder if her grandparents could have conceived of this awakening as they pose for the pictures, the dead hanging limply behind them. Not one of my students leaves before I talk them through this moment, offering them the balm of something akin to wisdom. I exercise the lying minds of race without leaving the scar. Outside the world awaits them but the scent of honey suckle hangs in the air, but it's for them and for their children's children. And I will read one more 
Uh, this is from uh, a new book in progress, um, following in Lenard's footsteps to think about jazz uh, in a tribute to a project I started with my partner who is no longer well enough to work. It's a gigan, it's a relatively new uh, form of poetry. So you're gonna hear some repeating lines and, and there's a little rhythm. There are a couple of words I should explain. And a madloza is like a shaman in a kosa. And so um, this is actually about um, Miriam Makiva, who left South Africa wandering for 35 years, working and singing to save us all. So here it is. Gigan for Zenzili Miriam Makiva. Like a fever dream, sweat streaming in the night, the Amoloza spoke clearly through her mother. This child leaves South As soon as you debut and come back after Africa screamed, you simply had to leave the stink of race and run, abandoning your quila jazz and the songs of the Shabins. The ancestors watched your freedom journeys, watched you while you were gone, Zenzi, banned for casting interdictions against injustice everywhere, against apartheid there, civil wrongs here, surviving years of fever dreams, sweat streaming in the night, far away from the quila jazz and the songs of the Shabins, standing at that microphone in front of posters of record companies proclaiming your perfect power. We long for you, Zinzi. Your jazz, your song is truth, a mandala of our communal call, and every song a devotion. I think I'll stop there um, just to see there's this one. Thank you so much, Sheila. Um, uh, powerful poems. Uh, uh, we have some time for uh, one or two questions for Sheila, if anyone, or comments, reactions. There are reactions in the chat. Sheila, I hope you will get to read, uh, but maybe some people will comment now. Can you say more about the program? Well, I just also wanted to... Yes, I'm sorry. Could you say more about the Gagan? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, the Gagan is an interesting poetic form. Uh, it's it's comprised of a series of couplets and tercets. So it's a couplet, tercet, three couplets, and, and a tercet, and it ends with a couplet. And you've got a couple of repeating lines. The first line repeats as the 11th line, I believe, and the sixth line repeats as the 12th line. And so it gives the poem a, an interesting rhythm of its own. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And I wanted to say um, the tribute to my mom, the first poem that I read is actually based on her experience working as the first non-custodial Black employee of the city of Raleigh. It made the AP wires and went around the world. Um, and um, I'm just thankful that I had a mother who gave us that kind of strength. Actually, and uh, Dr. Sheila, we actually published, you'll remember that poem, and I can't remember whether it was any muse or in Pine Whispers, but uh, that was one of the selections from uh, Leonard Moore's uh, anthology, All the Songs We Sing. I think that's correct. Yes, it is. Um, I try to take my mom with me. We lost her in 2020. And um, I just, I think all of us, anybody who knew her, uh, knew the power that she had to touch everybody's lives. Any other comments or questions? Not, is there time for me to read one more? Yes. So on the break, a couple of people were talking about futurism and it's something that I really love. This is also from the newest book and it's about um, an interesting person called Sun Ra. So if you don't know Sun Ra, uh, infinite person in jazz. He pioneered actually musical art forms with uh, his work on the keyboards and electric keyboards. Uh, and he believed that he was from Saturn and worked very hard in his muses in his life to, uh, to, to remind us of it. So this is called Futuring. For precisely seven years, 12 days, 17 hours, five months and counting, Sun Ra has been calling. 
I long for the connection of channeling him, of feeling the rings of Saturn as he plays them like keys in concert we could be. But how does one return from being enchanted by the enchanter? How do you separate from such a soul? Until you can answer me, prove that I can be unhooked from his swirling, I just cannot go. But here in my safe space, I think of how he aligns with the sun, how space is the place of longing and circuit. I often pass by his home at 5626 Morton Street. Imagine I hear him call my name, but I never approach the star signs on his door. Some evening stillness, I see him descending the stairs in that house where I have never been. He is always lit by whatever light placed him here to future among us in this place where we only pretend to see all the splendors of purple as it pierces the darkness. Thank you so much. Wonderful. I'm so glad you ended with that. Uh, and it brings us back to Afrofuturism again that we had this mm -hmm. morning. So that's, that's fabulous. Mm -hmm. Thank you again to Dr. Sheila Smith-McCoy. Um, our next reader is Ashley Lumpkin. And I think most of you know her from her uh, important roles in the uh, Poetry Society. She was raised in Georgia and she's based now in Carolina. She's a writer, editor, actor, and educator. She is the author of five poetry collections, At First Sight, Second Glance, Terrorism and Other Topics for Tea, Hashtag Ashley Lumpkin, and Genesis. Her book, I Hate You All Equally, is a collection of conversations from her years as a classroom teacher. A lover of performance as well as the written word, she has been a competing member of the Bowl City Slam team since 2015 and currently serves as assistant coach. So please welcome Ashley Lumpkin. Thank you so much for that introduction, David, and thank you to, to um, all of our readers from this morning's session and this afternoon. Um, I, uh, I have the unfortunate uh, position of reading after Dr. Smith, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not excited about that, but I will, I will do my best here. Um, I want to start with a poem um, that I wrote uh, many, many years ago. Um, a friend of mine was giving birth to her first son and she was live tweeting the experience. Um, and in response, uh, all of, all of uh, the group of friends from college started writing poems and um, started writing poems and creating all sorts of art pieces kind of to honor the first baby that was born into our group. Um, and so I wanna start with this. It's called For Nye's Son on His Birthday. The day may come when the hounds are sent to lick the brown from off your skin, to steal the fire from beneath your eyes, to pull the truth from out your throat. Do not fear, remember who you are. Remember you chose your own name. You are hurricane and hustle hard with love enough to clench your teeth. You are cayenne pepper and ginger root. This heritage don't come easy. You are warrior and hip hop gospel. You soldier and sound till the sun come boy. Do not let them quiet your music. A prophet was made to sing. And for the days the song gets heavy, remember your mother is ocean and psalm. She is still water, quick tongue with a mean right hook. She is law and lawless when it comes to this heart. You are two sides of a coin picked up for good luck. You make your own fortune here. Remember to breathe. Remember to pray. Remember these days are touch and go. Remember this poem, how it come from the stars that brew inside your belly. Be a galaxy boy, a courageous heart. Be peace and protest to the lightning fall. Be a light to this world. We welcome you. Um, this next piece is... Uh, I'm gonna read it with no, with no commentary. It's called Bloody Sunday. Okay. The thing no one remembers about Bloody Sunday is the day before was just Saturday night. 
just a few colored folks gathered in the living room to talk about the walk they take the next day and Amelia fried the kind of catfish that could only come from East Savannah while Coretta stirred the collared pot enough to fold the vinegar in. Martin cut up at the kitchen table till folks couldn't sip their lemonade, afraid the laughter would transform the mouth into some kind of water hose. Nina got to, way she, got to sing him the way she did that new Negro classic music till Bayard stood and taught them all a kind of freedom shuffle and it went like that. The kids in the corner mimicking their aunts and uncles games till the quiet hush of a righteous movement lulled them all to sleep. The next morning, it was leftovers and grits, everyone fighting for the chance to say grace, knowing this might be the last opportunity to lead their friends in prayer, to go to God for the rights they've been seeking, but mostly the right to just meet again and eat and laugh the way they'd done just the night before because Selma wasn't a buzzword yet for everything that is still wrong in this country, just a place where Martin III watched his daddy play the dozens with a group of folks who wouldn't dream of calling him Dr. King, not even the boys on the front porch with the shot guns cocked and ready leaning into the front door to ask for more biscuits and tea and yeah maybe a photograph transformed the nation to a kind that cared about colored bodies but the thing no one says about bloody sunday is that night the movement was a waiting room a hushed murmur making the decision to soon march again even while the cute boy from tuskegee sat at amelia's bedside humming some marvin gay along with we shall overcome and no one knows what song it was that lulled her back to consciousness her face still swollen and bruised from where the concrete kissed her stubborn cheek pressed it warm as autumn leaves beneath a loaded billy club till the rubble of shattered bones crunched like branches underfoot she married that boy a few years later, but only because he marched that Tuesday, then came to tell the story about how some girl brought fish and cornbread and they all pretended to love it because they were too tired to say it wasn't seasoned right. And at least they hadn't lost their taste buds back on Edmund Pettus Bridge where so many things were left behind. Most folks who made it to dinner that Saturday did not make it out of the movement alive or at least without watching their best friend's funerals while the boys from the front door watched their backs and didn't that miss the point of it all, to give the whole of their lives to the struggle and still owe their grief as well, still owe their pride and uplifted heads at a time when they need only be asked to weep. And isn't that what we mean now to say that black lives matter? not just the dead ones, but the ones that are one day laughing and the next at the hospital door or jail cell or cemetery saying, my God, where did it all go? The thing no one knows about Bloody Sunday is the day before was just Saturday night. Just friends so in love with each other's laughter, they fought for each other's lives. That's that poem. Um, I'm going to read a brand new piece, a shorter one. Um, when Linda and I first started conversing about reading, um, it was to um, respond to a poem of Langston Hughes uh, called, uh, called Theme for English B. Um, and I don't know that this is a response to that poem and its, its content so much as, as a, a memory that it stirred up when I read it. And it goes like this. Fifth grade and Jenny Eastep invites me to her end of the school year party. Jenny with the eight brothers and sisters in a two big house on the other side of town. Jenny who told me once that when I got to heaven, God would make me white. And dad says, I have to go. Says, baby girl, one of the things you must learn is how to be the only dark face in a room like he could see the graduate program I'd go to or the private school in which I would teach, the crowds to whom I would read my poems, even though the poems were much softer then. And I shrug and tell him I'll go. We'll dance even to the songs I don't know, we'll laugh even when the jokes are not funny and he will pick me up early, be back on the right side of town before dark. Thank you. And I'll read uh, just one more. Um, this is called, this is called The Troubadour Leads the Rally. And I just saw um, in the chat, um, I'm reading from my book, hashtag Ashley Lumpkin, except for um, the poem I just read. Um, and I, yes, I'll put the link to that in the chat. Um, 
in a bit. <laughs> this is called The Troubadour Leads the Rally. This heart of mine is filled to bursting, wanting to write you a love poem. My pen, however, won't craft one now that Tamir went and got murdered, got shot down in the street like a bad gangster film over what should have been a good day in the park, and yet I'm all strung out, wanting to play you a radiant love song at half volume, of course, as Jordan will tell you a rattling bass will bring out the wolves, will bring out the catch and kill in a man, and I'm here, finding a word for desire to name the urgent call of my spine, even with boys face down in the train station trying to pull the new year to sunrise. How can I love you with this broken heart, red eyes and ringing hands? What left while knowing our children will be used for target practice? What left except these poems, this heart held in my hands, except teaching ourselves to love after being wounded, even with Renisha, and Michael and Jonathan and Sean all made spirit before outgrowing the flesh. This way I still choose to hold you is my only remaining resistance. For all this light gone stolen, I love harder, love harder while I still can. Thank you all so much uh, for your time. Um, I do not take it for granted. I uh, appreciate you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ashley. That's wonderful. Um, we do have time for questions or comments, response to these wonderful poems. Hi, this is Regina. Um, wonderful, wonderful reading. You Thank held you. it, girl. You held it. Even after Dr. Smith, it was wonderful. Um, I just, I just, um, wow. You know, you said something that really resonated. Um, with me you know how, how can you write these this love poem uh, the love poems in the midst of all that is that is happening that has happened um and i i would say that i find myself in that in a similar situation um uh, like I, I say sometimes i want to be able just to write about a flower but it's it's difficult um so um are you finding that uh changing uh, are, are, are you still in that mode are you still in that mode where your poems are very intentional and focused on what's happening around you or are you able to compartmentalize and kind of write about things that are not uh uh necessarily uh, related to so much of the the trauma that we see today so one of the things that i'm learning is that i don't have to compartmentalize um that um, I, I say to my friends all the time, Martin Luther King played spades. Um, and in the moment that he was at the card table, he was not any less a revolutionary. Um, and so the part of me that is a teacher, the part of me that is um, an activist, the part of me that is a girlfriend, all of that shows up every time I write. Um, and so if that means that the poem is just about flowers, cool. Um, but I also have a poem about sunflowers that's actually about the murder rates, you know, in inner cities. So um, I, I try not to compartmentalize. I try to bring all of me to the page um, every time I write. Excellent. Do we have anyone else who'd like to add a comment? Ashley, I'm just uh, wondering how you developed your poet voice and also your speaking voice as you read poetry. Um, so I will tell you that my, my, my speaking voice as I read poetry is a direct result of uh, singing in the Sunshine Band Choir, growing up in Old Time Way Church of God in Christ. Uh, and every, everything I know about oratory comes from my experiences uh, in church. Um, and I guess the, the, my poetic voice and um, my style of writing as it exists now, um, <laughs> uh, my style of writing as it exists now um, is, comes from navigating the world between the stage performance and competition and um, publication. Um, and just navigating that line between the page and the stage. Um, yeah. 
Well, if I could follow up on that, uh, are there some poems that, that you perform live that don't come across as well on the page and vice versa? Um, so the answer to that question is, if a poem is not going to come across well on the page, if, if it doesn't work on the page, it's not going to work on stage. Um, but with that in mind, when I write, I always write with the audience that will hear it in mind first. Um, and so that's where the, the cadence comes from and that's where the rhythm comes from, um, even on the page, because it is always my intention that someone will interact with my poems in an audience while I'm speaking. Which doesn't mean don't buy the book, you know, by all yeah. means. Yes, <laughs> <That's> absolutely. <good. laughs> by all any, means. Any final comments? Well, Just, this, you know, Linda, how about you? Yeah. Well, this well, I, I, book out loud to ourselves when we're when we're reading it, not silently. Mm -hmm. Yes, I I always believe that anytime you read a book of po of anyone's poetry, you should always read it out loud, um, because because poetry started as an oral form. You know, it it started that way. Have you thought about and, and um, have you thought about ever including a um? Because I've been thinking about this too, including a link with your with your written book that goes to um you actually you know you voicing your poetry um i I've, I've thought about it um and i don't know if that's something that that i personally will do but i do know a lot of spoken word artists who are in the process now of like creating uh, audio versions of their books um so people can can hear them read it but i'm also i'm also interested even though, even though I write knowing that I'm going to perform, I always love what happens when someone new reads the work. Um, and so I don't always want my, my actual voice to be the voice that you hear in your head when you read. Sometimes like I want you to experience it as you reading it aloud. As well. Have you ever had the experience of someone um, actually reading your poetry and 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 coming up with an interpretation that is just really not what you meant. <laughs> you know, have, you know, has that ever has that ever um, happened? So um, it's, it was mentioned that I'm a member of the Bull City Slam team, and we often will read each other's work or perform each other's work um, in practice. Um, so I've I've heard my poems done by <laughs> done by some of my my favorite poets, um, and the interpretation is is always different, um, but helps me find nuances for my next performance. So it's never something that like, I can't, that it's it's not a, a situation where they perform it in a way that I didn't intend. They just bring different nuances to the stage that sometimes I'm like, mm, no thanks. Uh, but sometimes I do incorporate those into my own performance. I have a question and a comment. First of all, you're at, at, a, at a top of your game where, I mean, as far as performance and as far as right as a literary poet, quite mm -hmm. frankly, that some people are not there on either side, quite frankly. So, so how do you see that the typical, even there are some great, I've had some great spoken word uh, artists and I love their performances, but I've seen what, seen the same thing written on page and I wasn't so impressed if I saw it on, but, I, but because I've seen it performed, I knew what it was. So in the same way, take what I've seen people have write beautiful things on the pages, but when they read it, it's like, mm, I didn't quite take it that way. So what do you think is the takeaway that spoken word artists and the literary artists can learn from each other? Um, I think one of the things that all poets should be doing is as you're writing, read it out loud to yourself as you're going. Um, and one of the things that will do for, for a person who is writing primarily on the page, it will help them understand um, where the musicality is in their poem versus where they think the musicality is in the poem. Um, I think sometimes as we're writing, we have our, we have our own voice in our head as, as we're writing. 
Um, but then when you, you find that when you read out loud, it actually doesn't fall the way that you, that you thought it was falling in your head. Um, but if you are reading out loud while you are writing, you will say, oh wait, the, the, the rhythm is here, the breath is here. And that will change whether you use a comma or a dash. That will change whether this is a new stanza, whether, oh, this is a this is a couplet now, but it needs to be a terse set in the way for the for the rhythm to work in the way that I need it to work. Um, and I think for for stage poets, um, one of the things they need to learn from page poets primarily is how to appreciate silence. Um, I've seen so many poems fall flat because the poet was expecting applause um, and it didn't come or they were expecting um, laughter and it didn't come um, and they don't know how to recover from that. So just to appreciate to appreciate silence. Well, maybe we, our time is up and I think that's a wonderful place to leave us. Um, thank you, Ashley. Um, and thanks to all these wonderful poets. This has been a remarkable day. And I'm privileged to have been here for the whole thing. So um, uh, I will hand the mic back to Celestine, I guess, at this point. Perfect. I'm just going to say good, uh, have a great evening. And I'm going to let Linda close out the day. And so, Linda? I can't say enough. I, I really can't. Um, it breathtaking, breath pausing, breath, I mean, just... You know, we may have among us, uh, we do have among us future poets laureate. And uh, there's, there's really enriched my life today. Thank you. And I hope all of yours, and please search your, your soul and, and see if there's not one, uh, one thing that, that uh, you can uh, share your time and talent within the North Carolina Poetry Society. I thank David and Bill and Celestine and Shannon and all of the, those of you who prepared, especially for today. And then all of you that I had another chance to be, to see, be seen and see you today and to meet new people. You will all enrich our work and our state. And I uh, thank you very much. And it's 2.03 and we're gonna all sign off. So, okay, Any, anyway, so save the chat. I figured it out 14 times now. Okay, okay. bye. Bye-bye, okay. thank you again. Have a great day, people. Bye, dear, thank bye, Lenore. Thank you Lenard. so much, everybody. Great bye, leadership. You. leadership. Thank you, Ms. Karen. Thank, thank you. Bye, bye everybody. Hi, Karen. Bye. Get in the reading. Great job, Ashley. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, oh, Linda. Thanks, Linda. Yes. Oh, Leonard. Who will talk you, to Leonard? Hey, Bill. See you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. I would not have known about Sheila McCoy if it weren't for you, Leonard.